It's time for Twig This Week in Google. Jeff, Stacy, Ant, they're all here. We're going to talk about the big T-Mobile hack and what you can do about it. We'll watch a robot write code, uh, and then we'll debate whether disinformation is the fault of social media or just a side effect, plus the history of retail. It's just changed dramatically. It's all coming up next on Twig. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twig. This is Twig. This Week in Google, episode 625, recorded Wednesday, August 18th, 2021. You can't handle the waffle. This Week in Google is brought to you by Modern Finance. Are NFTs here for the long haul? Which cryptocurrency is a fad? How does decentralized finance work? Modern Finance podcast hosted by Kevin Rose looks to answer these questions and many more about the investment marketplace. Download and subscribe to Modern Finance wherever you listen to podcasts and get ahead of the future of finance. It's time for Twig This Week in Google, the show where you cover the latest news from the Google-verse. Stacy Higginbotham is here, Stacy on IOT.com, and the IOT podcast featuring Kevin Tovel. Oh, I love your infinity scarf. That's quite attractive. It's a autumn. Thank you. Yes. It's cold. It was cold here today. Yeah. It's less cold now. But. Yeah. We were thinking of moving to Hat Island. It's right next door to you. <laughs> it's about this big. Do you know Hat? Do you like, know Hat Island? No. There's a little, I do not know Hat Island. There's a little teeny tiny island just off the coast of Bainbridge called Hat Island. Actually, it's really off the coast of Whidbey. It's in Puget Sound, though. Okay. Um, yeah. Are you going to have a boat? Because I need a friend with a boat. Oh, yes, we would. It's okay. it's a tiny little island. <laughs> but uh, I just, you know, you have to have a boat if you live there. I think that's the only way you can get groceries. <laughs> Right before we leave, Stacy, I think <laughs> we have to say hello to cousin cousin Ray. Cousin Ray, Stacey's oh okay. Cousin. We all need to say hello to cousin. Hello, Ray. cousin Ray. Ray cousin bless Ray. his heart. Hi, cousin Ray. Hey Ray. Thank hello, you cousin for Ray. Watching. <laughs> we got one. That's my buddy Ray Boyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's Jeff Jarvis, ladies and gentlemen. He's the hey, Leonard Tau. Cousin Tau. Ray's best friend. Cousin Ray's best friend, Leonard Tau, professor for journalistic innovation at the. Craig Newmark. Craig Newmark. Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of... I talked to Craig about coming on and joining us for the chorus. Oh, that would be great if he just popped in. Fun. Yeah. We could yeah. even... Um, we could even make like a little Craig Newmark pop-up that would just pop up. <laughs> oh my God, that would be adorable. Be hysterical. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that, that mellow, mellifluous, mellow bass basso profondo... Portal. Chortle is wow. Aunt Pruitt of uh, TV's hands-on photography. Hello, Aunt. Hello, sir. That was some pretty awesome alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we're really pleased to announce that Aunt is now uh, officially the community manager for the uh, club. He's wow. so beloved by uh, our club Twit members. We thought it'd be great if uh, we needed somebody to take point on this, and Aunt has kindly uh, agreed to do so. So... Thank you. He is Ant. indeed beloved. Yes, thank it you. It is That's my pleasure, all of us and the, I appreciate the, the opportunity. Oh yeah, we love uh, we love uh, both Ant and Club Twit. So, so you might want to talk about the offer and and the opportunity that is the club right now. That's a good idea. Seven dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff's worried about his paycheck. Seven <laughs> seven dollars a month gets you ad free versions of all of our shows, audio and video. A special feed just for you, the Twit Plus feed, which has things like that fun bit we did before the show that you didn't hear because, well, unless you. We're here by chance, but it'll be in the Twit Plus feed. And then, of course, there's that great Discord, and we love our, our Discord uh, fans. And uh, it's a great place to have conversations, not just about the shows, but uh, about the Discord anything. right now. Uh, Hedge36 says, uh-oh, Ant's management now. <laughs> yeah. hey, you watch it, oh. Hedge. I know who you are. <laughs> <You're> in charge. <laughs> Think about it this way. Are, Think Hedge. about it because... If, if anyone's throwing a party, you want to go to the parties that the cool people are throwing. Ant is that person. Yeah. He yes. won't let anybody yes. get out of hand. Hey, yeah, that's true. A lot of fun. Yeah. Nope. No, He's the host no and the bouncer. grabbing people by the collar. Yeah. 
No, so we're really, thank you for uh, agreeing to do that, Anna. We really appreciate it. It's going to, I think it's going to be a lot more fun with Anna. He's going to, you're going to plan some events and we're going to do some fun things and so forth. Maybe we'll get Craig Newmark in there. Hope so. Yep. So bad news for you, T-Mobile folks. We, uh, we were hoping it was just a bad dream, but no, T-Mobile now admits that the motherboard's vice investigation was accurate and their data has, their data has been hacked now, mm-hmm. Motherboard says it's 100 million users. T-Mobile's only admitted to 40 million so far. Uh, this the is information is upsetting that they got away with. Oh, yeah. You want to hear what they got? It's Ooh, yeah. Essentially, it sounds like it's the... You know, when you get a smartphone these days, they do a credit check on you. So you have to provide information for the credit check, including social, date of birth, things like that. It's the even if you didn't sign up for a T-Mobile account, but you got the credit check done, it's in that database. So even non-T-Mobile customers, you may be bit if you've ever tried to get a T-Mobile account. Social security oh. numbers, phone numbers, names, physical addresses, unique IMEI numbers for your phone, driver's license information. Motherboards has said they've seen samples of the data and they did, in fact, contain accurate information. A hacker is selling uh, a small tranche of this 30 million of these for six bitcoin two hundred seventy thousand dollars. he says he has 100 million from you know and this happens a lot uh, a database left open t-mobile uh initially reacted last week saying we're investigating now they say yeah 7.8 million current users had information stolen along with 40 million records from past or prospective customers who had applied for credit is it possible that t-mobile didn't know this and motherboard revealed it or the t-mobile knew it and didn't say it and is thus violating i think some laws yeah motherboard it, it, certainly that. gdpr has a uh, and i think california also has a breach yeah, both have a law notice. that you have a day well you have a certain two, amount of time 72 hours i don't know how long t-mobile it's pretty quick okay yeah uh yeah well we don't know uh we don't know you know how when did they know and how did when did they know it and what did they know and all of that but uh um they say, T-Mobile says, the hack doesn't appear to have included credit card details or other financial information. That is in uh, contradiction to what Vice says. Um, hackers uh, are selling it, which means, so T-Mobile's got, but hey, the good news is T-Mobile's <laughs> offering uh, all of you uh, two years of identity protection services. <laughs> <laughs> and they're changing the PIN numbers on your accounts. So T-Mobile has started sending out text messages to customers. We're sorry your house got burned down, but here's a bucket. Yeah, here's a bucket in case you mm. need it. <laughs> Better bring the bucket. <laughs> uh, that's just that's just awful. Um, but it's just continually happening. You know, you can almost assume it's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but this ties to it's not in here. But I did write something last week about regulations I would like us to have for, I, I called it the era of IoT, but this particular story hits on at least three of the things that I think we need. Seven uh, principles it, for regulation of the is. IoT, in the IoT uh, era. Yeah, and, if you scroll down, you'll, you'll yeah. get there. <clears throat> so one is, for, for this one, it would be, in some of them we've talked about, like number two, we did a whole show on. Um, but if you scroll down, I think to, let me. Let number me two is up, rethink so. the Fourth Amendment for the digital era. Somebody pointed out, and I, I take this correction, like, uh, you know, that I was conflating the gover- the Fourth Amendment limits government's unreasonable search and seizure. But I have to say, that's the presumption is government has that power and ability to do that. If somebody else does it, that's just against the law. <laughs> you right. know, no, right. no non-governmental, no law enforcement agency has the right to search your house or your phone. Well, in so, the, the government is actually going through private entities to get access to this data well, to avoid true. this very yes, issue. That's true. But the T-Mobile thing, I was thinking fits with three, yeah. which I think we need way way more, like way higher penalties for things like, I even say this, leaving unencrypted personal datas in unlocked cloud instances. Yes, they're that, negligent and they should be paying a yeah. price for that. Yes. And then, yeah. And then also letting people, uh, yeah, we'll go with that. Anyway, I just wanted to put that out there because I really, I'm getting very frustrated with this idea that most of us were like, 
Oh, hum, it happened again. It's oh, and one. it's the yeah. seventh. My seventh principle is rethink our current forms of identity and create different layers of That's identity. That's important. Mm. Social security number is a bad yeah. way to identify people. It, exactly. it shouldn't be used that way. So we need a layer. We need a couple layers. We need like my stupid New York Times password that who cares if it gets out, right? We need things like for pretty secure things that are tied to our financial data, but could still be easily changed. And then we need like an inviolate thing that no one sees, except for maybe the government right. won't pay our taxes. Anyway. Mr. Sir okay, touched that's on it. this a little bit uh, today on Floss Weekly. Uh, maybe it was at the end of Floss Weekly today. Um, sovereign identity and the guest was was saying okay when we go to a bar and they want to make sure that we're you know of age to be able to drink alcohol people hand over their driver's license that has their name their street address their height sometimes their weight their date of birth when all they really need is a, are you a, over 21 or not mm -hmm. or are you of age mm -hmm. it's a yes no but we hand that information over and and Searles was saying you know we need some type of sovereign uh identity process to that, that will protect us as the consumer as well as you know keep all of this stuff out of the hands of big tech where breaches don't really matter so ironically much. it's big tech that's proposing this kind of thing there are all sorts of proposals use your phone uh apple has something like this where uh they control the information when you use your apple uh, card that the, mm -hmm. the merchant mm -hmm. gets and they offer to use uh, a special email address so that you'll get email, but they won't know your email. And I think you're right. I think it should be, I don't know if you could tie it to the smartphone, but there should be, this is what data, years, months ago, Stacey was talking about your data blob. This is kind of like mm -hmm. that. This is the, the idea the phone could hold all this information and then there needs to be a system for saying in a trusted way that's this is your birth date or you know just the stuff they need and i think you could do that on the phone but the other piece of this that i've i've, uh, I've long wondered is if we presume that n amount of information is going to get out no matter what then what we need to do is 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 also regulate the other end of this and that you can't do certain things with certain basic oh, that's good too. information yeah uh, and, that, and that there's more security required on that end so that if they know your mother's maiden name or if they know your address or if they know your social security number, which they already do, then already nothing do. can be done with those things. Well, there, you know, there is a credit freeze. Uh, and and uh, thank goodness the Congress a couple of years ago passed a law saying companies cannot charge you for uh, doing a credit freeze. You can go to the big three credit reporting agencies, TransUnion, Equifax, and um, uh, I always forget the third one. And uh, Experian. 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 The one we don't like. And, uh, and one, <laughs> 10 points to Ant's team. 10 points. <laughs> and uh, there's credit freeze and credit lock. You can investigate the two, but they shouldn't cost you any money. <clears throat> it keeps people from using that information to get That's credit in your name. Lot. It's a pain. You know where it's a pain if you're younger and you're actively renting and buying houses right. and buying cars and getting credit. But nowadays they don't they can't charge you to freeze and unfreeze. So uh, I think a credit freeze is something worth looking at. I honestly think you should probably freeze your credit with all three reporting agencies. I we keep ours frozen all the yeah. time. Yeah. It used to be you had to have a reason um, but now, nowadays, I, you, you no, don't. It's just a right. Yeah, yeah. It should it's a right, um, which we do too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You do it. You do it as well. I should probably do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good idea. It is. That's the only thing is you have to unfreeze it if you want to apply for credit. So if you're doing that a lot, it's not very convenient. Yeah. When we had to get our mortgage, it was kind of a yeah. pain. They all have these apps, but they're terrible. And you're like, <laughs> well, they don't want to so make them bad at this. They don't want to make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know, but man, it just drives me bonkers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So did you, did you remember, Stacy, before you applied for the mortgage, did you remember you had to unfreeze it or did somebody call you from the bank and say, um, Ms. Higginbotham, you have something I'm, to do. We're organized like that. You yeah. Are, Thanks, shocking. Andrew. Yeah, yeah Andrew, Andrew's <laughs> got it all under control. Shocking. He's got everything on lock. But do we Sorry, think I the T-Mobile hack? 
Oh, no, I was going to ask a question about the T-Mobile hack, which is, do we think this could be used for SIM swapping attacks? Is that where we think? Because I know that was a worry people had. Oh, yeah. Well, T-Mobile is now going out proactively changing pins for everybody who was affected. That's exactly how. If they got the pin, and apparently they did, otherwise T-Mobile wouldn't be changing it. Okay. You could pose, I could pose as Stacy, and they'd say, okay, hello, my name is Stacy Higginbotham, and I need a new SIM. <laughs> All right. You have hours of my voice. You could do a better deep fake. <laughs> All right. Come on, man. Stacy, uh, what's your pin? And I go, well, and I know your pin. Date of birth, yeah, I know that. You know, I mean, it lasts for the social, I know that. You know, most cases, that's enough of a hurdle to get to get that SIM sent to a new address, so... Yes, yeah. it could absolutely, but that, you know, also identity th fraud of all kinds. So not good. Not good. Thank you, T-Mobile. Hey, you were mentioning carrying the phone um, as part of your identity, but what about the folks that are well, that's the loose problem. with their phone? That's, you know, <laughs> that or don't want to have a smartphone, which is still right. a significant percentage of the they population. They still have right to identification, yeah. Yeah. you know. Then you need your blob, and you need to be given. The blob. I, th I feel like blockchain is it would be could be a solution for this, but you need some sort of digital thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe you carry a digital card. You could have instead. like a keychain or yeah. a key card, like a little yeah. bob. Yeah, yeah, a keychain for the blockchain. I mean, <laughs> wrapped in foil. So title. You know, there's a, a significant blockchain. portion of the population who say, under no circumstances, am I going to carry around any federal? But that's oh, the worst course. thing. The federal government. Instead, we're just going to we're tech. just going to inject it into your bloodstream with the vaccine. Yeah, just just relax. It's okay. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Watch it now. You're going to get people fired up. <laughs> oh, those people oh, have stopped that. listening long ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was Ant's community manager voice. Did you hear that? Yeah, Watch thank it you, now, Mr. People. Community <laughs> Manager. You're absolutely right. Well, I suspect Ant has family uh, back east, maybe who uh, feel that way. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think surprised. we need a meme that Ant can put into Discord. The, wait a minute, you're going to get people fired up. I mean, uh, meme, please. Somebody make give give them meme. about 30 seconds. It'll be there. I know, they will. They'll do it. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so there you go. That's the uh, T-Mobile. I led with that just because, uh, gosh, it seems like um, it's such a big it's deal. It's not good news. It's not so, such a bad... Do you want to... Let's run this open codex... Live demo. So I put a time code in there. You can go into about thirteen forty. Okay. Um. Uh. So so, you you should explain what open codex is because better than or open AI codex is better than I am. But well, I'll just say. So what this is is a demonstration of code writing code, and you guys might look at this and say, "It's nothing that's stupid." But I looked at it and I was I, I was fairly amazed because it uses as a learning set <clears throat> at one point in this all the APIs out there and tons of code. And so you tell it what you want it to do, and then you watch it write the code to do that. And so I thought- This reminds amazing. me a little bit of what GitHub's doing, which is the GitHub code, code pilot program yeah. where you can ask it, hey, I can't remember how to create a random number generator and it'll, it'll paste the code in. It's getting, and it's actually been controversial because it's getting its code from some of those same places, but also from public GitHub projects. And, um, and that's a little problematic reusing that stuff. Uh, let's, that problem? This could also so. do things like somebody wrote that code. It. Uh, it'll it'll recognize oh, but I thought the antecedent. You said public. Public doesn't give up your rights to it. <laughs> Just because. Well, as I was going to say, no. if public doesn't doesn't necessarily mean open source, correct? It, it, no, it is open source, but it also does not give up your rights to it. There's all sorts of ways you can license that, and if you don't license it, then you have. Not giving gotcha. up any rights to it, so I can publish source code that I still own that you can't, re you shouldn't, you can't theoretically reuse. You can't, yeah, cut and paste and use yeah. your own stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, a lot of people were a little upset about Copilot. There was also the issue of it not being very good. Let's take a look. This is uh, an artificial. So, so the first demo that is, is a hello world demo because you have to, right? Uh, and they and they have to do more things. But then the second demo, which I gave the time code for, uh, it's gonna it's gonna write a game. So uh, OpenAI was Elon Musk and a number of other companies uh, founded this as a nonprofit. But they've just, so far, it's interesting because some of the most scary and interesting developments in AI are coming from OpenAI. I think they don't feel as constrained as a company would be. Google mm -hmm. might be a little slower to announce some of the stuff that OpenAI is just going, yeah, hey, look what else we can do like, uh, like this. All right, well, let's give that a try. Um, so first of all, I'm going to look up uh, a so, silhouette of a person. 
they're going to make a game of a, of a, of a boulder hitting a person. I figure we should probably not use a real image of a person for this because they're going to get squashed by a boulder. It's going to take a few minutes. Very wise choice. And what you see here is something very similar to the previous the demo. Accent is where killer. Greg is typing the instruction to the text box. Then he presses play. So he, he all he did was he typed, add this image of a person, and then he put a link in. Right. And it is now, uh, it is now it looks like in JavaScript, been added to, you know, it, it's been created a, a var named image, uh, and, it, and it's actually been created in code, the model which is interesting. Right. does its neural magic and produces code, and now we get this oversized person on the page. Yep. And I, I want to point out, so the, the only difference here, as far as the the output is concerned, is this is outputting JavaScript as opposed to Python. It's actually the same model under the hood. So the only piece of magic we're not showing you right now is that we provide a little bit of context to the model. In the case of Python, we have just one example of following an instruction in Python. In the case of JavaScript, we have like two examples of, of doing it. Uh, and from there, the model latches on and just continues and continues. Wait a minute. Yeah, so I th they're, they're training it with a set of two instructions? Or must they, they, yes. No. Yes. Okay, fine. Well, like it was a good first <laughs> If it were that easy to learn a language. <laughs> mm. Well, no, no, there are various instructions. They're, 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 they're training with various, various uh, languages. Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. Step. But what I would really like is for the person to be a lot smaller and for it to be controllable with the left and right arrow keys. Great. And we also just got a report that the emails have started rolling in. So I think so he's now typing for, for into for, uh, a field, codex, the, so the English great. language text, uh, so let's see right. how big we make, make the, the person, person 100 pixels. pixels. Does that seem about right? Let's find out. All right, let's give that a try. And actually, what I'm going to also do is I just want to show people the full prompt that's being sent so that you can really see wow. what's going on without any magic. So I just opened up the Chrome inspector. We have a completions endpoint, and you can actually just uh, scroll to, this, the, to the post message, and you can look at the entire bit of the so prompt. Uh, and just let me do show an HTML you post what that looks like, expand to it out. And to just, to just explain what you're seeing here, the way this neural network works is that it's a really, really good pattern completion system that happens to work on patterns in code. It's like the world's best yes and improv actor whose domain happens to be code rather than improv. Well, that uh, really makes it uh, crystal clear. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying <laughs> so hard. Yeah. I'm getting them. Plus, this demo is really compelling so far. Okay. It is. It okay. is. So we simply provide it with this context of, oh, you're supposed to follow some instructions. So and you're typing in plain English and it's writing the JavaScript code. So far, right. Right. Okay. it's not so been too complicated. Yeah. So far. So we's got but the person's 100 pixels. Look Wait. Good. I think so. All right. Now, what do you want me to have? Image.style.width so, equals so I want it to be 100px. At a reasonable position at the bottom of the space of okay. the screen. The, and to be uh, controlled. The impressive errors. thing was it right, understood well, who this that. person so first, was. Let's set its position to. More of to uh, its position. Say, right. Now it says its. So it's, uh, it's understanding the context. And 400 pixels yes. from the left. The antecedent. Seems reasonable as far as I can tell. All right, these, these, though, are fairly. I mean, that's right, not hard to. Translate. I know, I know. But yeah. it controllable. Image.style.left equals 400 pixels. Right right top arrow. equals 500 pixels. <clears throat> now, this is a pretty high level instruction. That's hard. Exactly right. Now, this is yes, a hard one. Make it controllable with the left and right arrow. The model really has to infer what's going on in here, and it can't look at the screen. The model only has access to all of this text over here. And so from that alone, it has to infer what to do. But let's see if it worked. Let's see. I'm curious myself. The code looks reasonable. OK. It's quite good, but this looks like something I don't quite like. It goes I off the edge. I don't want it to be able to mm -hmm. get out of the screen all like right. this. Yeah, but you didn't, te you didn't yeah. tell it, but uh, it is not to do that. Pretty yeah. good. But let's well, see it's if just a, a, an if statement. So constantly check if the person looking for the key code off the left screen, arrow 37 and put it and moving back it left 10 pixels screen. it did make some so, so again pretty high level um it's constantly check if the person is off screen and put it back on the screen if so okay. wow oh that's that's, 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 that's okay. okay if so that's pretty, pretty good to me yeah, it's pretty good that's, what that's about nice. the other side let's yeah. see what's happening there you should point out i would this like is, i would have put okay, it so back in the middle too yeah well except that you see this flickering scroll oh yeah so they're gonna do that and fix that fortunately you can just say disable scroll bars by the way i actually don't know how to do this in javascript does the model know? Well, well, let's well, it's obviously document.body.style.overflow so, equals hidden. <laughs> Everyone knows that. Um, so there is, there is a suggestion from Twitch to see if we can make it move upwards. If you this would be, certainly would right, be helpful well, let's give it a try. Um, to do a so you know, make preliminary run at something. Uh -huh. Although anybody who's ever written any kind of game code, this is 
boilerplate in their yeah. head. Well, so you don't have to, but you think about if you're like doing your website or you want to build a table. Go, I mean, like I can remember building awesome. tables in HTML. Yeah, that's, and like okay. yeah you know, this would be great myself. for building HTML tables. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's so kind of I'm like, that there's a lot of things that I'm like, oh, yeah. this could be helpful. Ooh. Let's see. So or it's, it's, imagine if I could use it to make API calls for my okay. smart home gear. So I could be like, right. Uh -huh. If I could like tie it into like the LifeX API and say, hey, if you see that the weather is this, turn it blue. And I could just type that in just like I do with like Ift or anything. But if I could do that on my own and host it myself, how baller would that be? So oh, 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 here's a Google angle. What? What if this was in place when Chrome OS was needing to be updated and someone forgot a semicolon? <laughs> <laughs> There are programs to fix that they didn't use, obviously. So this is interesting. It's cool. And now they're adding a boulder, and they're going to crush this guy with a boulder. And um, You know, this is, this is a um, example of a program that you would have in the first class of your computer science, you know. Yeah. College computer science. Uh, yeah, it's very, I, I all that, very but basic. It's, but but still, it's, it's very interesting, yeah. <laughs> And you know what I love? The, actually, the thing I like the best is taking the prose the guy types in and makes it the comment, which in effect yes. is self-commenting code, which is really great. That's cool. <laughs> the next one also uses the Microsoft Word API. Oh, that's interesting. See, for APIs, this would be great to write API code. Yeah. That would be so I would, handy. I would use that every day, yeah. all the time. Yeah, APIs are kind of, everybody's got a slight difference and... So they, the, the prior one did a, 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 a thing of um, uh, uh, Hello World. Then they had to create a web page with Hello World multiple times. Then they created the option of sending you, getting an email wow. of that plus Bitcoin char, uh, price. Um, and so it used the, um, what's, what's the email, uh, uh, MailChimp API. So I'm really, it's, the thing I'm most curious about is, when they ask it to write the code for collision between the boulder and the guy. I, that, okay, we'll see. That's something that is easy to understand and takes a lot of typing. Well, <laughs> wait. So it would be really great if, if I could do that. It would just save me a lot of typing. Well, can't you do that with like, I mean, that's part of sometimes what game engines have. You know, they write all the Absolutely. physics behind there. Absolutely, Okay. Yeah. But this hey, y'all want a quick update? Yes. Uh, my dad just texted me and said, I don't know what you said, but Ray said to tell you thanks for the shout out. <laughs> Cousin Ray is really happy right Hi, now. Ray. <laughs> Hi, Cousin Ray. Ray. We're going to drop a boulder on you. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is cool. Open AI Codex, a live demo of an AI writing code, which has been the holy grail in computers. Uh, yeah, it's just a beginning. 70s. It's just a small demo, but yeah. it starts to. It's interesting. When, when you realize that the, what the learning set can be, and then how you can speak to it, that starts to get your brain. Yeah, yeah. I'm starting turning. to think a lot of things like uh, AI. I'm going to call AI. Kevin and tell him AI. his master's is going to be useless. <laughs> Poor Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know how to do all this in Python. I, I will say that no code, there's been so much venture capital going into the no code. Mm -hmm you know, startups. And the reason is because we're turning everything we have into software addressable right. devices and right. things. And we all have to be, it's like, I know people said everyone would learn to code because that's like literacy. I don't actually know if that's the case. I think not everyone will learn to write, but everyone will know how to read. And I think these no code platforms are kind of like the basic literacy and maybe actual coding is like someone being a writer, like a, yeah. Fancy writer. Got some signs of life. We're going back. And yes, there we go. All right. Very nice. This is very, very nice indeed. It's it is rain and boulders. Right, great. So I think in order to, uh, in order to cool. put a cap Cool. Thank you uh, for that link. We actually have a little more challenging link from Jeff that we're going to talk about in uh, just a little bit from Harper's oh Magazine. Boy. Who says it's not a <laughs> democracy? Who says? We, oh. we need an ad before we do that because I have to finish reading it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you now have two waffle. minutes to finish reading it and get a waffle. Yes. Yes. I, I read it uh, at breakfast. You'll be glad to know on the breakfast table, so. Thank you for the link. I'm glad you sent it a little bit ahead of time. And, and, and your wife pulled you up out of the out of the plate of, of, of <laughs> potatoes. No, I actually had a lot of thoughts about it. So we'll yeah, talk. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting piece. It's provocative. It's from, uh, it's from Harper's Magazine, guy who for years was at BuzzFeed. Um, 
And it's about news, bad, fake news, and disinformation. Our show today, though, brought to you by my buddy, Kevin Rose, and his brand new podcast, Modern Finance. I know a lot of times, in fact, practically every time we talk about cryptocurrencies, NFTs, we get all twisted around trying to explain and understand what these things are. Robo-investors, FinCEN. The investment world is changing rapidly. And, you know, I think it makes sense. If you're an informed person, you need to understand it. Fortunately, there's an easy, entertaining, uh, fun way to learn Kevin's new podcast, Modern Finance. Modern Finance helps to demystify crypto, decentralized finance, and more. Of course, Kevin Rose knows uh, Kevin, of course, with us uh, for a long time at the Screensavers on Tech TV. He was a host later in the attack of the show. He uh, is also a very successful investor. In fact, Bloomberg called him one of the top 25 angel investors in the country, one of the top 25 most influential people on the web, according to Time Magazine. Uh, he is a venture capitalist at True Ventures. He really understands how this stuff works and has made it his uh, business to really be able to communicate about it. Modern Finance is a show, a crypto show for the novice and expert alike. Their mission is to demystify crypto in the world of NFTs without dumbing it down. When I needed to know what an NFT was and understand it, that's where I went. It was actually the very first episode of MoFi, Modern Finance. And it was, it, I felt like after I listened to it, I got it. I got it. Uh, there's two. There's actually two shows on one feed. Uh, one is the weekly consensus episode. Once a week, it explores the latest news, distills it into digestible information, a great way to keep up. The other, Kevin interviews top tech experts and entrepreneurs, individual crypto founders, NFT artists, talks about modern finance tools, helps you understand cryptos, NFTs. There's Amy Wu talking about gaming NFTs. And D5 versus C5, I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to listen to that episode. Now, I missed that one episode. For She's from Lightspeed. Uh, fascinating stuff. You could Don't let that crypto guy be the life of the party. You could be the life of the party. By listening to Modern Finance, you'll feel well-equipped to discuss, maybe more importantly, understand the crypto and NFT landscape. Kevin Rose, Modern Finance, every week. Ten years ago, people called cryptocurrency a scam. Five years ago, people thought it was a fad. <laughs> now, my daughter is celebrating the fact that she bought Dogecoin. It's over a trillion-dollar market and growing. The Modern Finance Podcast lets you make sense, helps you make sense of all of the coins, NFTs, and chaos. And it does it in a good-humored, interesting, and very informative way. Kevin's great. The financial landscape is harder than ever to navigate. You don't have to do it alone. Download and subscribe to Modern Finance wherever you listen to podcasts. That's Modern Finance wherever you listen to podcasts or go to mofi, M-O-F-I dot net. That's the website. Don't be the last person on the next train out. Listen to Modern Finance and get ahead of the future of finance. Really happy to support Kevin's latest uh, venture. It's kind of a wonderful full circle um, of the podcast world to come back around to Kevin advertising a podcast on your podcast. Isn't that funny? This. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin's great. great. I am a huge fan and uh, really glad to, to be able to support him a, a little bit about it. Um, I'll always remember the time you did, you surfed, you body surfed the crowd. Oh, yeah. At, at Kevin's South party by. at South by Southwest. Yes. Yeah. You, you saw that? Whoa. Yeah. And you still were willing to be on the show? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I saw your butt crack going by. Uh, uh, <laughs> you might have. It wasn't my fault, man. I was being manhandled at the time. <laughs> um, I have to confess something. Uh, I was watching all about Android last night, and Ron convinced me to buy a Samsung Flip Phone 3. Oh, boy. Wow. Oh, the little The little, the little one. Yeah, I already had the Galaxy yes. Fold last year, and I thought I don't, I, I don't want that. Yeah, and then Ron pointed that, out yeah. that I could take that old one and get a pretty good uh, money back for it. I think more oh. like six or seven hundred bucks back. This is the coolest. Oh, okay. Thing well, ever. yeah, didn't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And well, I can't wait to see that. Nine ninety nine, right? Yes, yeah, nine ninety nine. I got it for three forty nine. Oh, yes. Ooh. After uh, tra like after trade. Yeah, and you get a if you order it now, you get one hundred fifty dollars in extra crap. In fact, it was a little oh, hard. The Samsung the earbuds or the watch, but I had, unfortunately I already yeah Samsung credits. I already ordered the watch, so but I want to try the, you know, after all the I iPhone the stuff, I'm thinking maybe I maybe I should 
go back to Android. So I'm going to try that. And of course, the Pixel 6 will come out in October, and I'll try that too. But yeah, the watch looks pretty cool. Well, anyway, I'll give you a report. Uh, Jason also reviewed the uh, Pixel 5a last night on All About It. It was a really good was review, but also Did amusing Jason and confusing. It? <laughs> Between yeah, uh, 5A, 5, 4A, 4, ABC, it's really hard. So, yeah, I mean, they. The, so what they've been doing is introducing the flagship phone in the fall and then six months later introducing a reduced cost, reduced feature version of that phone. And that's what this 5A is. Uh, it's kind of a reduced cost feature of the 5. Not so much different, but uh, about half the price. Yeah, I think he liked it uh, quite a bit. But the, and actually, everybody does. All the reviews are very positive. It's just, um, you know, you got the five, the six coming out in two months. It's all about a time. I mean, maybe thing, when I see think? the six, I'll be like, oh, too much money, or it's right. not good enough. Maybe. Right. I'm, yeah, that's a thought. That's right. a thought, Stacey. I don't know. But um, and maybe he's going to talk about this on Hands On Tech when it drops later today. But did. Did you all see the subscription options for this for this device? Or was it fifteen dollars a month on Google Fi what do you, for the device for two years? Oh, in addition to your Fi fee. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> um, so <laughs> <laughs> I was truly really trying to shot. figure out a way to get that in there somehow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they also reviewed the Z Flip uh, Three and. Uh, they took a look at Android 12 beta, so a good episode last night on all, all about Android. So, and they convinced me I should. I've done the fold. I don't. I don't like the big folding phone, but maybe the little one because it's so cute. You just go right in there. It looks cute. It's got that screen on the other side. I thought eh, maybe I maybe. Yeah, I think St Stacy was convincing me last week that there's a there's a there's a use. There's a market for, for that. I, yeah. I, I yeah. want. I mean. It opens if up I to be you a normal. Like yeah, it opens up to be a normal sized phone, but it will fit in Stacy's pockets. Right and in my hand. I mean, I'm sorry, but like, yeah, yeah. I have normal sized hands, but I'm a bigger woman Plus, than other people. I've been going down this road of bigger and bigger phones with all of everybody else, and now I'm mm -hmm. thinking, yeah, maybe a smaller phone isn't such a bad idea. And flipping is fun. For a size, I didn't mind just the size of the four A being a little bit shorter. Yeah, than it's a little smaller. XL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, Plus, when you're Maybe mad, you can you snap it shut see. with the emphasis? I would be careful with that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, would, I, would, I don't think so, Stacey. Like, I don't think so. And we're done. Whack. Whack. And so is the phone. <laughs> Whack. <So's> <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can, the only thing I don't like is this kind of, it looks like a clothespin when you look yeah, on, you, on the side. I don't know why that bugs you so much. Yeah, I don't know. Well, because yeah, stuff gets in like that crack. It'll be okay. It'll be okay? Will it be okay? It's not a navel. It'll be... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, no. <sighs> I'm excited. I can't wait to see it. Please bring it on this show. So I we will. Can talk about I'll it get it August 27th. So eight or nine days. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. I, I settled for Phantom Black because that's the only one I could get like on the 27th. I have to wait longer for the other pretty colors. But I don't care about colors. Um, I care about colors. Yeah, what color would you get? Lavender, green, gold. I didn't see. The, I didn't see the Samsung colors. The colors so aren't that know. good. They're not. They don't look that good. I like orange and royal yeah. blue. Yeah, I know you're talking. Yeah, I agree with you. Something a little that pops. You want something that pops? Yeah, I would even do bright red. Yeah, like no, this whole awesome. Google loves pastel kind of thing. All of their home gear, all of the, you know the even the the new Pixel colors look kind of muted and pastel. Yeah, like, let's get some. Pizzazz. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Jewel tones, baby. Jewel you know, tones. You know what you won't get with a Pixel 6 or I don't think the, with a Flip uh, 3 either is a charger. Everybody's doing what Apple did and uh, leaving mm -hmm. the charger out. I just well, wish they, they didn't they don't change the charger, it. that'd be okay. Right. It'll always be Type-C now going forward. And, you know, part of the reason people say this is, uh, you know, there's a huge waste. Everybody's by now got a Type-C charger. You can buy one if you don't. But considering that probably most people do, it's just a waste. Let's not add more plastic waste. I'm kind of behind that. And it also saves money. <laughs> uh, yeah, say, and if I we go to wireless power. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the crack. chip shortage, some of the power components are an issue there. True. So, you true, know. true. Oh. True that. True that. Uh, 
Uh, there is, uh, we reported that uh, Amy Klobuchar and uh, Dick Blumenthal and Marsha Blackburn had united to create an unholy alliance in the Senate to put proposed the open app markets markets app last week there is now a similar act in the house be interesting it would force both apple and google although i think it's a little less onerous for google mostly for, this is aimed at apple to allow third-party app stores and third-party payment platforms on their phone google already allows third-party app stores samsung has one um so i'm not sure this would change how google does business they mentioned Google, though. They say, uh, Dick Blumenthal said, the legislation would break the competitive hold that Apple and Google have over the app market while providing mobile users with more control over their devices. Apple says, oh, yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, How much of a security issue is this? Uh, I think it's quite a bit. Yeah. I think it's quite a bit. The thing I think about is, uh, you know, Google's always had this setting, and they warn you when you check it that you could download uh, sideload apps or get downloaded from another store. Uh, and Epic, who didn't want to pay Google their 30% on Fortnite, just like they didn't want to pay Apple, when they released uh, a new version of Fortnite on um, Android, put it, you know, sideloaded it and said, well, you have to check this box and go out and get it and download it that way. Make your phone vulnerable. And almost right. instantly, within a day, some bad guy was putting a, a malware-laced version of Fortnite up. And a number of people got that instead of the real Fortnite. So there is a risk. I mean, it's, there's clearly a risk. Um, I'm not, you know, I think Apple could find a way to make this. What, what Apple will do is probably what Google does, which is put up a bunch of warnings saying, you really don't want to check this box. It's going to cause all sorts of problems. And I think most people won't, won't do it. They'll just go, I don't do it on Android that much, right? Do you? I mean, I have. Yeah, to, I mean, side loading is you know, kind of a pain. I mean, pain. I've done it yeah. on occasion, yeah. but. Yeah. Yeah. But just as long as it's since available. The days in of rootin' and ramen. Yeah, I liked rootin' and ramen. Oh yeah. Yeah. In fact, if I get a Pixel Six, I'm thinking of rootin' it and putting a, a privacy forward uh, OS on it, like Calyx OS, just to try it. And report, oh, like what Mister Tofu did. Yeah. Didn't he did Tofu do it? Oh, he's a smart boy. Um, he's been doing stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know if he. No, he's using the iPhone right now. You can't root and rom the iPhone. Nope. <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> It's not an option. No. Mm -mm. Uh, all right. We could talk about it, Jeff. You uh, you put this article in our uh, emailed it to us think, all. I gave us I'm homework. Gonna, yeah, because I thought it was so interesting. Like but I a think professor. I'm going to get abused momentarily, but that's okay. Jo uh, Joseph Bernstein, who uh, was at BuzzFeed writing in uh, Harper's Magazine. What do you what do you think of Harper's these days? Uh, yeah. I used to it try, love it. It tries a little too hard to be weird. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I used to love it. I don't, I'm not sure I like the new Harpers that much. But this is an article about, in fact, it's the cover story, Disinformed, How We Get Fake News Wrong. And in it, Bernstein... Big Disinfo, as he calls it. Fake Disinfo. Big Disinfo. Big, Big Disinfo. So it's kind of a, a, an industry unto itself now. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one of his points, which I have to say is absolutely true. Uh, he's, he says, only five years ago, Mark Zuckerberg said it was a pretty crazy idea, that's a quote, that bad content on his website had persuaded enough voters to swing the 2016 election to Donald Trump. Voters make decisions based on their lived experience, he said. Quote, there's a profound lack of empathy in asserting that the only reason someone would have voted the way they did is because they saw fake news. A year, which, by the way, I think, Jeff, you agree with, right? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's too simplistic to argue that someone was perfectly normal walking down the street. And then they saw a Facebook post. And suddenly boom. saw something and yeah. came nuts. Yeah. A year later, suddenly Chase and Zuckerberg apologized for being so glib and pledged to do his part to thwart those who spread misinformation. Uh, he also says uh, that this the kind of denial... Uh, that we, we didn't influence anybody is frankly not consonant with their business. Facebook's basic business pitch made denial impossible. Zuckerberg's company profits by convincing advertisers it, it can standardize its audience for commercial persuasion. Right? So this is the how, key to the piece. Right? How, how could it simultaneously claim that people aren't persuaded by its content, but they are persuaded by the ads? <laughs> right. That's what's fascinating about this. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it shows kind of an unholy alliance, he says, among um, journalists and researchers and technology and all of them. But, but, but that's the primary argument is that, that if, if you um, 
if you say that advertising doesn't have impact, then you have to say the propaganda doesn't have impact and Facebook can't do that. Right. And so they kind of allow, it's almost good. For, if people argue that this info is good for Facebook's business, which I think is, is crap because it's a bad experience. But in this sense, Bernstein has it right, I think, because they're saying that, that if you deny, as Leo just said, that disinfo is influential, then you deny that advertising is influential, and that's bad for your business. He also points out that since time immemorial, or at least the turn of the last century, uh, it's it's been kind of hip to talk. I mean, it's not this is not new to talk about how propaganda can you know change people's minds and so forth. Going back even to uh, Vance Packard and the hidden persuaders. And he says, in almost every case, this was overstated. But advertisers eat it up. Advertisers love it. And mm -hmm. I know this from our own experience at Twit. Advertisers really... Uh, it's, it goes along with the fact that advertisers want to know all, all this information about the audience, that they want to do targeting. They, they really want to believe that this stuff is, is persuasive. Let's and be clear. The podcast advertising is absolutely influential, and a million people have already signed <laughs> up for Kevin Rose's podcast. No doubt. It's all the other stuff that isn't, just to be clear here. <laughs> what, if, what, if it's not, what if it's not persuasive? But what if it's what I felt this was missing was what if it's not persuasive, it's, but what if it helps normalize a, yeah. it's a not worldview? Black yeah. yeah, because yeah. I do yeah. think the challenge here isn't that I will suddenly see one anti-vaxxer post and be like, oh, my gosh, they're right. I should never get a vaccine again. What it does is it makes me start thinking about something. And I, we had, you know, journalism professors, people come in and they'll, you know, they'll tell you something demonstrably untrue but then you'll start thinking about it and you'll be like well could that be true i don't i don't actually know it, it calls into question like what you believe um and i do think there's something to the fact that you're normalizing by bringing people of a like mind together in normalizing the things they say to each other it does make it easier to go out and have a belief that i'll call it an anti-social or an anti-society kind of belief whereas Prior to this, a lot of our goals were about fitting in. Does that make sense? And we had, yeah. But also, Stacey, I think I think, but it also ties into the media piece here, right? That that once mm -hmm. it's what you're saying that once it's out there in the conversation sphere, then it can go lots of places, right? Yes, and it not only can it go lots of places, but it will influence people who thought, oh, do I want to believe that? I guess these people believe. Okay, I guess that's not crazy to believe that. Sure, toothpaste causes cancer. I, I, honestly, we have plenty of, and admittedly anecdotal, but plenty of, in our own lives, I'm sure you do too, Jeff, uh, examples of people who have gone down a rabbit hole, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, have, you know, followed that rabbit uh, to the craziest of conclusions. Maybe they would have done that anyway, uh, maybe, but it certainly facilitated it, right? What? That's why QAnon yeah, says do the research. Where do you think that research is happening? Well, in the halls of disinformation. And, and, you, and you search their terms like incel and you, and you, and you go down mm -hmm. their rabbit hole. Yeah, that's their desire. But, but what, in, what impact does that actually have? We don't have enough research. We don't know. But just um, don't, don't you, on I, the face of it, doesn't it seem obvious that it does? No, no, no. I think uh, it does. I, I mean, I think it changes enough people's minds and brings them to places that they otherwise never would have considered. I mean, think about the idea of sheeple. The whole goal there is like, hey, you're going to think for yourself by adopting this whacked out worldview that you always that you never questioned before. And the reason you never questioned it was because, you know, yeah, we know the earth is round, right? But sheeple now, they think the earth is round, but really, if you do the research, it's flat. I, let me I tie it to, to what you just said, Stacey, a minute ago, though is that it's a permission system for a belief you already have. It doesn't suddenly make you believe that, belief. Um, that they don't Q like black nobody, people. Nobody in their I mind. I think a lot of people have no, that, no, no. and they found no, no, a no, no, wait a minute, Jeff. permission system from the top down. But, but think about QAnon. Nobody in their mind just independently comes up with, you know, I think the Democrats are uh, have a pedder, pederasty ring, and they're sucking the blood of children to stay young. I think that's what's happening. Let me check. That comes from an external input. You cannot but, say that but, that's but, internal. But, but this is we have this discussion. But that's not that's not the 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 uh, driving belief. That's the device. That's the MacGuffin. 
it's meaningless. You don't right? think it's QAnon just, people believe off. that? No, I actually, I, I've said this on the show well, before. Well, I know I QAnon people to, who believe it, so. Uh, no, they, they, well, they want you to believe they believe it, and they've succeeded. I think there's a mix of people that probably fit into both of those camps. In, in less yeah. so QAnon, but think about things that have an actual impact, like vaccines. Yeah. I mean, let's let's take out the lizard people and let's just talk about vaccine misinformation, which, you know, I think we all have a vested interest in getting the right again, information to the right people. It's not black and white. It's not as if somebody is persuaded to change their views 180 degrees. I, I agree with you. In most cases, it's not. But there, But I also don't think they're not not influenced by it but this is third person effect uh I, you know how, how am i immune when everybody else is a mess and the quote from the piece is the question is why do disinformation workers think they're the only ones who've noticed that facebook stinks why should we suppose that the rest of the world has been hypnotized by it why have we been so eager to accept because it has silicon three and a half billion story because it has three and a half silicon billion active, valley's story no see i put this i that that uh, that, that line to how me, easy we are to manipulate that line to me That's was bull because three and a half billion active users somebody likes facebook you think yep. they all hate it no 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 no, no as, it's not that as, it's just that we think that that facebook has manipulated them and changed them and it's miserable and 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 and, and, and that somehow they're they're no they're not there for that in fact we'll have another story up soon about facebook's new numbers about what people see and and we, we're doing this without data to know both what do people actually see because there's presumption that because it's on Facebook, everyone has seen it as an old media presumption. And then what impact that has and what impact it has separate from the other ecosystem. Last week's story we did about the uh, the study about YouTube videos, not, not radicalizing the way it's thought, but it fits into a radical larger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I, I do agree with you and him uh, where he says that the establishment needs the theater of social media persuasion because the current political world doesn't make sense to them. They need they need right. to explain Brexit and Trump and the loss of faith in the decaying institutions of the West because otherwise they'd have to look deeper at, at a deeper cause for yeah. all of that. And it's a lot easier That's just key. to say, well, it's they're being, you know, these these otherwise normal people are being persuaded by uh, you know, disinformation in the in the media. But I but it's not uh, it's not an either or I, I think that's true, but it's not an either or. And I, I feel like you and he are uh, unwilling to recognize the, inf the, the certainly the role that the disinformation has. I'm willing to recognize it if we can get the data to get the research. Well, you don't, I don't think, right? see how you well, can I, say I it think, doesn't have a role. It, uh, it's patent. I don't see how you can say it does because I don't think you, there's this presumption that goes on. And I, I, I repeat again, Axel Bruns' book, Are Filter Bubbles Real? We all presume filter bubbles were there. We had to create... Uh, um, uh, interventions because filter bubbles are awful and the research says not so much. YouTube is radicalizing everybody. The research last week said maybe not. Um, we, what if, and, and, and by the way, what holds us up from this research? The fact that the platforms aren't giving us data. I feel like you, it's, uh, you, you're, you're saying, what are you going to believe? The research or your lying eyes? We're surrounded in a world by people who are influenced by this and you say, oh, what well, the research says they're not, but they obviously are. I don't, maybe Jeff, I don't, maybe you don't know these people. I know these people. And I know here, they, they, I, and they were already effed up. Here I am. And, and this becomes in. a way to, sorry. Andrew. Here I am. I'm going to step in and oversimplify this. It's <laughs> there. Th those people are out there. Do you, how many times have I walked outside and heard someone say, I saw on Facebook, I saw on Facebook that blah, 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 blah. And I just shake my head thinking, oh my gosh, this, this people are believing anything. It's everywhere you go. And, Three billion users out there. That's a large percentage of people in that three billion that just believe whatever the hell is put on that service. I see. That's why I, I give people more respect than that, Ant. I, I think they have more agency. Wait, than hold that. on. I think they have more history than that. I don't think that they can be influenced that quickly by that. And this is what the story says that that fits into the Vance Packard view that advertising can hypnotize them and get them to change their, their world. That's a myth, I think, to a great extent. And it's a myth that what hurts if we our adopt business. We know advertising works. People buy Tide we, because they've seen a lot of Tide yeah. ads. They're not it's they're not objectively deciding that Pepsi is better than Coke or Coke is better than Pepsi. Those ads oh are God, very God. effective. We know that. Let, let alone someone sitting in a big chair that buys from Instagram at least. 
Uh, yeah, one. they ads. Those ads work. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really true. I, mean, I know it from works. my own experience. Those ads work. Well, what if we? What if we look at it not just as ads, but what if we add the nuance here that politics has become for a lot of people not actually a way to govern, but kind of a form of entertainment. And if you think about us arguing about politics, you can embrace Jeff's vision of the person who's kind of trolling us with their belief in I QAnon, although I don't think everyone <laughs> does that. But in the arguments there then become more akin to like a sports rivalry. And I see this actually in some of my own family members who are like, stick yeah. it to the libs. But yep, when you I've meet them as people, they are compassionate people. And it's like they have a blind spot where their politics actually impact people that they're compassionate to and about. So there's, I mean, obviously I'm always going to argue for more nuance, but I think that's something to think about here is, is, he, is our is understanding. Of, also, sorry, I thought you stopped. No, talking. just our understanding of politics is become divorced from what politics, from policies, I guess, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. Stacey, isn't it just not, not entertainment, but also identity? Yeah, and it's a way to signal. I agree. It's a way to say I'm with this person. But I Whatever also, they say, I don't care what they say. I also, and, you know, I'll say yeah. I agree. Cause, cause but it's not it's perfect. not performative for everybody. I've seen marriages, no. several right. of them, break up over this. It's not performative for everybody. And uh, you know, and I, by the way, I take Bernstein's point absolutely, and will agree to it. Um, that. P, the the big tech it's in big tech's interest it's in big media's interest to buy into this narrative so you should i think my takeaway from this is you should take with, uh, with a grain of salt any uh, account from big tech or big media that oh all these problems are called by social media i wouldn't say that at all but i think you at this on the same time you cannot deny the impact of social media on this yeah, it has and we just an don't impact. know what we don't know just as fox time. news has an impact and msnpc has an impact yes yes I'll there is that. for sure an impact i don't think there is one culprit uh and and i think that he makes a good it's worth reading it because the point that he makes um he says in a way this is a, this world is a kind of comfort easy to explain mm -hmm. easy to tweak easy to sell it's a worthy successor to the unified vision of American life produced by 20th century television. Uh, yeah, we all want to oversimplify. That's a natural human tendency. It's hard to understand complexities. It's hard to understand gray areas. Yep, yep. But I think this is another way of oversimplifying. He's going the other direction of. Well, he's trying. He's trying to. He's trying to counterbalance. But it, so it's a what good. I, what I thought was I great about it's this. It's a good for our antidote discussion. to it. The oversimplification. Yeah, that's that's what it's there for. That's what. It's, yes. it's there, as Stacey would say, we need discussion, and this and this sparks discussion in interesting ways. And and as I said when I sent it to all of you in the morning, it has something for everybody because he's critical of Facebook and of Facebook's critics. Yeah. And and yeah. then and then puts them together in an interesting way to say what are they really believing and saying? Now I know somebody um, uh, who does his disinfo work got got insulted by this, and I, I don't think that was the point. I don't. Think, there's a lot of good disinfo work that goes on, but there's also a lot of stupid well, moral entrepreneurship. Bernstein that goes kind on. of implies that there it's all with a hidden agenda. Uh, you know, he was yeah, he mocks the disinfo people. Quite a bit in this art in this piece. Yeah, but I but I think in a way it was it was part of his effort to um, show a different end of the prism. So I I, I don't take that terribly seriously. Yeah, don't take it to. personally. Uh, it is yeah, a cover no, story I, on Harper's. Uh, I think it is perhaps a little one sided, but it's a it's a good as, antidote. As you to said the, earlier, Harper's is like these days. Yeah, yeah. It's provocative. He, he mocks the Aspen Institute's. Uh, he says, exquisitely nonpartisan commission on information disorder, co-chaired by Katie Couric, featuring Yasmin Green from Google's Jigsaw, Gary Kasparov, the chess champion and Kremlin critic, Alex Stamos. I mean, this is a pretty, you know, Don't forget the royalty. Yeah, glittering. Alex, St yes. Prince Harry. Prince Harry. <laughs> Alex Stamos uh, from Facebook and uh, Catherine Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch's estranged daughter-in-law. Important to put that word "estranged" in there. Um, yeah, I could see if I were somebody on this commission, I might be insulted yeah, one, one, by how he's I, mocking I, I know it. I wasn't too happy about it, um, but I, I, I don't think that should be taken too seriously. I think it's um, um, it, it's a way to counterbalance, and it's rhetorical, 
and I think he went a little bit more there. The, that's fine. Uh, among the commission's goals to determine, quote, how government, private industry, and civil society can work together to engage disaffected populations who have lost faith in evidence-based reality. Well, it seems like a, a, a Which lofty is a reasonable, goal. a reasonable goal, and 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 it I hope will spark the kind of research that I want. And so I'm I'm dandy with that. I yeah. think that's yeah, so that's important as I long as understand. it comes out of evidence. <laughs> he says this commission is the latest and most creepily named addition to a new field of knowledge production. <laughs> that was a little funny. <laughs> Called say. big disinfo. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, uh, bunch of you know, and it, but uh, I would like I would like a coffee cup that says "Member of the Big Disinfo." Big Disinfo, yeah. that's us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I just think it's so obvious that this stuff has an impact, but I don't but, think it's the villain in the in the play. It's just one of many. Well, and if, but if we're going to win policy, to use Stacy's proper word, and and interventions, to use mine. Um, around presumptions rather than around research, it's a problem because they may be the wrong ones, right? The one I've used on the show a million times is the kids are all right. They're not spreading the disinformation. It's grandpa who's messing up the world. But we've invented all these media literacy interventions for the kids who are actually much more savvy than we give them credit for. And grandpa is... Grandpa's the one really on Facebook. Messing things up. Yeah. I, I yeah, think grandpa's grandpa has been... The, people have been trying to get to grandpa in a while. And I feel like we can see a lot of studies. A lot of studies have come out recently showing the correlation between uh, people's uh, lack of trust in government and all of that with like the prevalence of Fox News. Um, so I think there's a growing awareness. The, the challenge with research, though, Jeff, is when you're looking for data especially with social sciences, you can find it yeah. and oh, you oh, can yeah. make yeah. these yeah, correlations. Exactly that agree. That you, you also can't find some of it, Stacey, because the, the platforms are the well, ones who have it and they won't give it to you. Yeah, we talked well, yes, to, we've talked that. about that as well. That's key. Yeah. No, I'm right, with thank, you, thank Stacey. You I have a little bit of... Uh, I don't have a lot of faith in, quote, research as being the definitive uh, answer to any of these questions. Um, evidence, then. Call it Evidence. I, I also think that, I mean, I mean, let's just get on the soapbox about America. I feel like if people mm -hmm. were a little bit more secure in their livelihoods, I feel like if people were yeah. a bit more secure in their neighborliness, I feel like we could be better. Um, but that's just not happening right now. So. I think the latest census is the basis of so much of it. That for the first time, white population in this country went down relatively. And that is scaring some people who are losing the hegemony they enjoyed for four centuries. And I think we can't not look at deeper roots like that in this discussion. And to think that it's some new thing that came along that made us worse as a country. Yeah, I mean, I'm the first one to yell about Fox News and I think it's done terrible things, but it started before Fox News. It started before um, uh, talk radio. Uh, so I also, there's many causes. There, you and I will agree. There's many causes. It's complicated, and I also would point out that yes, that might be white white terror over changing demographics might be part of it, but let's not forget how unpredictable a Hispanic vote was and is. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not necessarily the case that uh, that Hispanics or people of color vote as a block either. So I don't, you know, I don't. I think it's. I think what's going on is a little more complicated. I think it's very complicated. I don't think we it's really can understand it. And I certainly agree that we shouldn't blame big tech or social media for the, our woes, whether you know contributory or not. They're they're not to blame for our woes. Um, if it, if they if they're successful, yeah, if those they're not, ads are not successful. The root. It's because they fall on fertile ground, right? John, John, can you can you take that as a snippet that I can I can refer to back <laughs> in future shows? I mean, I've always <laughs> thought that this is nothing new. Um, what, what is it Jesus said? You cast your seeds upon the ground. Sometimes it lands in fertile ground, sometimes not. On good ground. Yep. Yep. Unfortunately, in this Thank case, the good that. ground is bad ground. Yes. <laughs> that, well, that's, that's the really interesting thing, because what happens is the bad guys use our own um, beliefs against us. Right? We believe in open information. Well, that's very easy to manipulate. Um, and, and so that's what's happening is, is, is a lot of the... Um, Virtues we saw in an open media ecosystem are now being used badly, yeah. and we don't know what to do about it. That's part of his point, I think. But thank you. That was enough. I, I don't mean to take over. It's, a, it's a good, good topic. It's, uh, a, it's a provocative yeah. piece. I felt it was a little facile, personally. But yeah, a little glib. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Uh, but not. But but point well taken. Uh, let's see here. What else would Jeff like see, to yes. talk about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's time. Uh, we hear from another quarter. CES 2022 is on, baby. Just Woo. bring your COVID card. Who's going? I'd go. What are your odds? Are y'all you going? Could, you, could editors, you could you put some crickets in there right there at that point? <laughs> yeah, <they're all> like, <laughs> <laughs> I, swear, I have I'm my vaccination card, but... That wants to go. Do you really want... You let, I don't want to go. You had such a good time at CES when we went love, in January 2020. The last conference. I feel like... I, said, it, I really... I'm fascinated by what COVID has done in this country and then the return of COVID has done and how quickly people were willing to go pull back. Some people and other people said, no, no, f f forward. I'm fascinated by this and I'm mostly fascinated by the drastic changes that are going to occur in our society. People not mm -hmm. coming to work mm -hmm. because they can work from home. And I have a feeling that conferences, just like malls, <laughs> are going to mm. be one of the casualties of yes. COVID. Yes, yes. Well, WPPI is still happening. Uh, that's the photography well, uh, These are vestigial. I think these are vestigial right spasms of a corpse that is already dead. Cedia that's is still a, happening. Yeah. Cedia. Adobe Max uh, kicked, they announced their dates for October, but I believe it's all virtual and it's 100% free again. So that's two After... <laughs> After CES 2020, when you guys went, come March 1st, did you look back and say, what were we thinking oh, yeah, going we, somewhere? We all did. In fact, everybody was very nervous. I was nervous, yeah. Yeah, Larry Magid. Uh, so, so Larry put up a post on uh, Facebook, I think, or somewhere. I saw it somehow uh, saying, I, there was somebody at CES with COVID. I met with him, and I met with all of you who are getting this message did anybody get sick? And none of I think none of us got sick, but that wasn't the Delta variant. No. Yeah, yeah. And, but he looked bad that day when we saw him. He looked bad. Yeah. He, yeah. He was. He got really sick. Uh, Lisa got really sick, but uh, uh, Lisa, yeah, she did. That's Lisa right. did not get COVID, as far as I know. We did the antibody test, and it said it was negative. We had a pretty terrible faculty meeting today to speak out of school. Um, where the students are supposedly required to be vaccinated, but now it turns out they're not all vaccinated. The faculty and staff are not required to be vaccinated. Uh, a lot of my colleagues have kids at home who can't be vaccinated. Yeah, and, reasonably. Um, yeah. A they're lot 12. of anger and nerves about this, including from yours truly. Yeah, but mm -hmm. what do you do? That's the thing. I understand mm -hmm. absolutely the anxiety this is provoking. And I don't know what you do. So uh, you mandate vaccinations for one thing, and you take care of your own people. Well, this uh, is one thing that see the Consumer Technology Association is doing. They're going to yeah, good for require them. require uh, vaccination. Vaccination. It's not, not one of those tests. Not vaccination test. Masks uh, will probably be required uh, in all the public indoor spaces. The organization God, said it's assessing whether to accept proof of a positive antibody test as an mm. alternative requirement. Uh, but they're going to defer that until closer to the date. That's part of the problem is we're in terra incognita. No one knows what's going to happen next month. You know, there's a Lambda variant. No one knows. Yeah. Yeah, I'm supposed to fly to Michigan to give a speech at the end of October that was, it's, it was canceled from April of 2020. Wow. And I don't know if they're going to cancel. I, I was like, look, y'all can have your money back. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do something virtually for you. Like, I, I just don't know, you know. They don't know. No one knows. That's the problem. No one knows. That's the problem. And, you know, the people who are saying we have to get back to normal, like, like I totally agree that I don't think, I don't want to live like this. I would hate for my daughter to grow up in a world that has this kind of, like, abject fear about being in public with people. But I, we we can't do it unless we have... <laughs> I don't know, vaccines, Safety. more people vaccinated. I, I feel I like know. we th were briefly seduced by the notion that vaccines could fix this. And now we're getting disabused of that notion. 
I think they vaccines could have done, could a, lot have done a lot more to help if more we had got, I mean, but we always knew that you had to get to a certain level with them. We yeah, always knew that if half the people were vaccinated, it wasn't going to work. We did. We also underestimated the strength of breakthrough uh, of Delta and breakthrough infections. I Maybe mean, normal people did. I felt like we were, we knew to that, me, Delta looks. We knew that was going to happen. I don't know. I think people are willing to now pull back a little bit more than they were. Uh, I think there's a lot of trepidation. Kids are going back to school today in uh, yeah. California. Kids are, I mean, kids are already back in school in yeah, Texas. Yeah, started yesterday. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of trepidation. <laughs> and I just feel if like I were a pa if, nobody knows what's yeah, going to happen, right? If I had a kid under the age of 12 who couldn't be vaccinated, I mean, I look at this and I'm like, man, what, what do you do? And this is where I feel like we're entering into this level, like we talk about distrust in the government. I think what we're seeing right here is visceral reaction to a failure of public policy that it's going to hurt us for a long time. I agree. And not just in the QAnon way, but in an actual way that affects real people. And uh, Some of this was misguided, just as it was misguided trust in the New York Times and CBS, misguided trust in public health officials. Uh, that we're well, now no, learning. No, I think that's unfair. I think because I think it, it was it's, sci it's the science was changing. The knowledge yeah, yeah, was no, changing. No, that's what I'm the saying. The virus was changing. That's what I'm saying. We've all learned that it isn't as certain as they might have pretended in past. Uh, and and uh, we've seen the sausage being made. And and I think once you've seen the sausage being made, you never enjoy those it's bangers. Pretty damn the impressive same way. sausage. It's the very MRRs impressive. Jeff, what the are heck are you tweeting? Sausage. Oh, what did he tweet now? Who? You. Jeff, yeah. how are you talking about this and tweeting about snakes in the spice aisle? <laughs> I, it was a simple, I, saw, I, I could have brought it up on the show and you're, I spared you. <laughs> I'm flipping Australia. over to Twitter I just, just to check. And then I'm like, man. oh my God. Uh, wait, I don't understand. You, you did this 49 seconds ago. Yeah. While he was arguing with us about other things. My boy, That's are you talent. ADHD a little or... No, I'm just online man. <laughs> wow. That's impressive. I am internet man. I will say the snake in the spice aisle is very compelling. The fact that it was well, caught I mean, I by a snake I should have brought the show. Catcher. I didn't know. I could have done it for, for a closer. Yeah, but it's Australia. That's what always amuses me. Australia. You don't want to go there. Things will kill you. They will kill you in the spice aisle. A nine foot python a in python, the effing so spice aisle. Oh. A python, you know, it's going to take a while if it's going to kill you because it's got to squeeze you. Gotta so squeeze don't stress you. out. I don't move much. very fast anymore, yeah. Stacey. So, yeah. you know, it could happen. <laughs> Actually, uh, I just Twitter. saw some statistics about uh, death by reptiles in Australia. It's actually much better than you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> It's not bad. See, you just need the data. Just need That's the all data. You need is the data. It's just to the data. Right. We all live with these uh, <laughs> biases. Spiders and snakes, as bad as they are, don't seem to kill very many people in Australia. Maybe they just know better. I don't know. Hey, good news. Since we're talking about vaccines, Moderna is about to begin trials for an mRNA vaccine for HIV. This is incredibly good news. It's awesome. This is just yeah. so based incredible. on how many friends. Yeah, it gets to that idea of the mHNR. Okay. mRNA. MRNA Messenger vaccines being RNA. like software. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I it, love it. it. They were such success in sequencing the, the COVID-19 genome and then creating, literally, it only took them a weekend to sequence it and create a vaccine within a week. It All the time was wasted, in, not wasted, spent in, tri <laughs> in trials to make sure it wasn't going to kill anybody. But they had a vaccine last spring. And so the same technology now is being used on, on something, a, a virus that's been intractable for 40 years. All of a sudden, they're also reportedly working on an influenza vaccine based on mRNA. That so, makes sense. Yeah. Science. We kind of we knew this would happen. Actually, it was, uh, I was talking with Andy Weir, the author of The Martian, interviewing him about his new book. And he, he was saying... You, I don't think we understand what a massive breakthrough mRNA, mRNA vaccines are. Yeah. This is the, he said, this is the last pandemic. This is the last pandemic. Well, knock some wood, please, Andy. Yeah. Knock wood. Um, question. Well. So, go ahead, Stacey. No, I was going to ask, is Emma, oh God, I can't. 
messenger RNA Blah. vaccines Blah. are they Blah. are they only good against viruses? <laughs> Would they also work against bacteria? Um, I think they're particularly tuned to viruses because of the way viruses okay. work, which is to invade yeah. the cell. And, right, and so, um, but. Uh, that's a good question because, of course, yeah. you're just creating any. Ultimately, you're creating T cells and antibodies to fight the virus. I suppose you could do that with. Uh, I'm just thinking no, like malaria. Not. Now that's a parasite disease. Then you've got you know. Yeah, there's no vaccine bacterial for that. Disease. Uh, but for I, I'm measles, just about, mumps, like, the and all well, of the viruses, can cancer. You know, I, th I think that the, cancer the real frontier yeah. is is yeah. to do this kind of work around cancer. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Very, very uh, interesting. I, I, a curiosity question, because I, I think this will be a debate that comes up. So I'm, I would be due in eight months in, in late October for a booster under the CDA, uh, the, the, uh, um, the government's, the HSS rules today. Um, if, uh, so the debate is, do you get the booster? Do, you get, do I get the third Moderna? Or do you wait a little longer hoping that there's a version of Moderna that's specific to the Delta or the Lambda? Ask your doctor, Jeff. Yeah. Yes, I'm yeah. going to. You're yeah. my doctor, Leo. We're, we're not the people who Dr. know. Dr. Leo. Yeah. <laughs> this is like going on Facebook and asking your friends these questions. Lisa and I, well, I, was curious Lisa and I have yes, this conversation all the time. She, Lisa yeah. and I have this conversation all the time. She said, when can I get the booster? I'm getting the booster. I, said, I just say, wait, your doctor will tell you. Wait, wait, yes, <laughs> your so doctor right. will let you know. You have a well, good what doctor. I'm, what I'm curious about is the emotions <laughs> of it, right? Is what, what's the... What's the the um, I'm going up a wrong tree here, but but I, but I'm I'm curious how people will be asking about this and reacting to it, and playing the odds of the science. It's just find it interesting. That's all. <sighs> I'll ask my doctor. Yeah, that's no, that's a good question. I mean, I'll get. I guess now the latest is it, the CDC is expected to announce that uh, boosters will be suggested after eight months after you get the initial. Biden vaccine. said it this afternoon. He said it today? Okay, good. Yeah. 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 So that was the speculation. Now it's confirmed, um, which is fine with me. And it's the same one. It's just another one of the same one. And that really, the what I saw was a significant improvement in effectiveness, like on the order of 200%. Yeah, nice. So it's worth, it sounds like it's worth doing. Uh, let's see. Congratulations to Amazon, now officially <laughs> the world's biggest e-commerce company outside of China. Uh, Says a lot. This article in the Times was fascinating because it goes back in time. In the 1940s, the number one retailer in America was, quite, guesses, anybody? Sears Roebuck? Sears Roebuck & Co. Before Sears, it was A&P. A and P A and P was so okay, big that, makes sense. that it that the government was considering antitrust regulations against it in the forties. Unbelievable! Wow, I, you know, and this kind of maybe is informing. Maybe you don't need to do these antitrust regulations because times change and companies are on top now. And so A and P there's gave a book way. That I, there's a book I, I've got to mention here real quickly, Leo. Just, I, I think I mentioned the show before, but I, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend it. Uh, the Great A and P. And the struggle for small business in America. Oh, you because mentioned it, this before uh, uh, last year, the year before. before. Yeah. yeah, really good by Mark. I will Levinson. read it. And and I, I recommend it because because what it shows is the parallelogram here to A um, and P chain stores came in and ruined the Ma and Pa neighborhood store. Right, a preview of Walmart, but 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 the A and P was the first. A villain in this. And they were seen as the Amazon of the day, and they were seen as awful. There was tons of protective legislation against them. They were seen mm -hmm. as terrible. It was awful. The fact that they lowered prices was unfair, and, they, and there was laws passed to make them raise the prices on consumers. Um, and it's just amazing how similar this is, because it's once mass media was made possible to advertise something like the A&P, it made it possible with that in transportation, and it created the exact same kind of structure we see in the transition today. It's it's a wonderful parallel. So Sorry. it wasn't until the '60s that A and P was superseded by Sears. Sears overtook A and P as the largest retailer in the early 1960s by targeting middle class shoppers in the suburbs and expanding the department store model. Then the uh, the Five and Dime, the Walton Five and Dime in Bentonville, five Arkansas. And, uh, wow, that's the original yeah. one. Mm -hmm. turned into a behemoth. This was founded in 1962, right when Sears kind of took over from A&P. By the 90s, 
Walmart had surpassed Sears, opening thousands of stores, buying up competitors. And uh, just this seems to be kind of where they overlap. Just as Walmart beat Sears, this guy named Jeff Bezos, his hedge fund manager, drives out to Seattle with his wife and starts Amazon. And uh, the reason this is all coming up is because today Amazon became bigger than Walmart. Over the last 12 months, Amazon's uh, revenue was 610, retail only, $610 billion beating Walmart's sales posted yesterday of $566 billion. So Amazon, except for China now, you know who's bigger than uh, Amazon? Of course, Alibaba. Alibaba, right. Yeah, in China, yeah. Yeah. They sell to a lot more people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got a billion and a half customers. Oh. And they have some advantages. Yeah. By well, government. They might say disadvantages now. I don't know. Well, that's that's Jack, the interesting thing. Jack Ma may not it's very be. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So Amazon huge. Uh and but I think it's really important to understand how these companies without any governmental intervention have superseded each other every few decades as technology changes, right? I think it's interesting to see how technology is making it possible for Amazon because I can just think back to a decade or two ago being in small town North Kakilaki and having a discussion with, with people wanting to buy products and refusing to figure out Amazon.com. They'd rather just go to the Walmart. You right. Know? Well, obviously that demographic's shifting, but right. that's why Sears became so big, right? Because the catalog. I thought Sears yeah, became, catalog. yeah, the mail order was yeah. kind of Sears' catalog. big thing. Right. But right. that was the internet of... But that was the tech. <laughs> that was the tech of that time, right? That was the internet of that time. Well, also also the creation of the department store was a phenomenon. Exactly. Not unlike, Another one. Um, yeah. And, and, and you, what and you had was, was you didn't have the consolidation of Federated. You had every, every city had its own family-owned department stores, and they were huge newspaper advertisers. Um, and, but they, too... Agglomerated, you know, the, the Mrs. Jones's dress store dead, Mr. Smith's tie store dead. So mm -hmm. all these bigger things kept kept eating up the smaller things that came before. Uh, surprising how many years it took for Home Depot to kill the neighborhood hardware store. It's it's actually shocking that A and P was the number one retailer in America until 1965 when it was beat by Sears. I mean, I would have thought that happened a long time sooner earlier than that but well people did, didn't buy as much stuff back then no that's either. true so groceries oh, yeah probably yeah and food costs have gone down so much compared to like what a family of four used to spend on like percentage yes. of their income spent on yes. food back then right Oof. right the great atlantic and pacific tea company i like it isn't that that's i wish they kept they make thing. sodas don't they a and p no no a and w <laughs> <laughs> it's a little later in the alphabet, Stacy. Stacy's America. I'm getting there. <laughs> All right. We'll have more with our esteemed panel, Aunt Pruitt, community manager at our club Twit, as well as host of Hands On Photography and regular host here on Twit. Good to have you. Sad to say, Aunt had to go back in the uh, home office because of COVID. We're back on uh, on restriction. I'm all alone in the studio again. Yeah, only see his lighting looks so much now. better. I know it really looks a lot better, <laughs> but I don't look as small. I'm as not I, trying to insult your I studio people. Sitting next like... to me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeff Jarvis, BuzzMachine.com. Good to have you, and of course, Stacy Higginbotham, Stacy on IOT. dot com. Remember, Yik Yak is back, baby. I'm I think trying we, to forget it. Uh, we talked about Yik Yak when it was uh, all the rage, and then a scandal. About what is it? 2017, it went out of business. Uh, 2013 through 2017, the whole premise was uh, it's a anonymous. That's the bad word. Social network for people within five miles of you, and it was actually ended up being very big in colleges and high schools. But because it was anonymous, it also became very popular with bullies, trolls, and gossips. Uh, in fact, it you know, became a haven for bullying and harassment and threats and uh, eventually shut down. Somebody must have bought it. It was once valued at $400 million. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> it is, what a bubble, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, it shut down in 2017. Square bought a lot of the uh, original team. 
Mashable uh, has, has the story that they're back on the App Store, but they say it's unclear who's behind the app now. No, no one really knows who Yik Yak is or how it came back. Um, it showed up on Monday on the uh, Apple App Store as pretty much unchanged. But wasn't there a mention in, about their their uh, culture change as far as doing something for mental health awareness and, and you know telling people don't be jerks? On this oh, that'll platform, work. Even though it's hey, don't yeah, be jerks, okay? Even though it's anonymous, it's don't be a jerk. Don't be jerks. I think they got uh, <laughs> Kevin Malone from The Office to do an ad. Oh, Brian Baumgartner. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can I'd never heard of it. this app. I never heard of it in its in its. Uh, we heard about it. We heard about whatever. it because we talked about it. You know, at the time. Um, on I don't Twitter. even remember what phone I had back then, and I was probably on a BlackBerry or something and couldn't get it. Who knows? We've been uh, BlackBerry. We've been uh, doing Twig for how long? So here's uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, I give you. <laughs> Kevin, the dumb guy from the office, is back. Oh wait a minute, let me. <laughs> the yak is back. <laughs> it's back, baby. Hi, it's Brian Baumgartner here, and I am so excited. He has no idea what he's talking you about. You all, right? That yak Did they just buy a cameo. I think from it's him? a cameo. He's apparently yeah. <laughs> one of the most I'm popular excited. people on cameo. I yeah. I make a giant pot of chili. Uh, go to the app store. And download it for iPhone. I'm not joking. It is back. And it is better than ever. How much did you get paid for that? 200 bucks. Hammer debt check. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you go to Cameo and get these guys to do uh, ads? For their oh, regular maybe they fee? Don't realize they're for doing a small it? fee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just see what Kevin... Uh, I mean, uh, what was his name? Bill Bob? Brian Bob Brian. Brian Baumgartner. I want to just see what he what he would charge me if I uh, if I went to Cameo. This is curious. Uh, 195 bucks. It does look pretty much like the same as a uh, as a Cameo. In fact, I think he's in the, exactly in the same, same same spot. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like a Cameo. It's a Cameo. 195 wow. bucks. That a boy. You know what? Way to hack that advertising. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Break it in. Oh. He's, I guess he's, I don't know. Let me play something here. What is he doing? Here. Is he swearing? Well, hello, you beautiful cameo people. It's Brian Baumgartner here, and I am. See, he can't so say Kevin Malone the or the office. You. So, but everybody knows who it is. Of course. Yeah. Well, all the young the people. The next one looked like it was the, the same. Right. Yeah, it's the same background and everything. Well, so, so no, go back one. Go back. Go left. It's that. That one. That's the same. Just play that one. Play that one. I think it's, that it'll be a. It'll be a. Hello, Michael Scott. <laughs> Never mind. Oh. oh. And Liz. Well. He didn't even uh, bother to shave for this one. Ms. Uh, the easiest two hundred dollars he's made. And told me, well, <laughs> to love's eternal glory. As I value man, myself too much. Second. I wouldn't do this for two hundred bucks. Although he probably he shaved crank your head, out. But How many? Yeah, well, that's different. That was for charity. How many charity. could you do? There's, you could probably do uh, several hundred a day, times two hundred bucks. Oh, yeah, I guess. Well, let's boring. just say you're like that's good money. I would say I would dedicate like an hour of my day to doing these. So yeah. I can't imagine anyone wanting to pay two hundred dollars for me. But like fifty bucks, if I know I'm going to get fifty bucks to do five or six of Can these. Can I be your agent? No, Andrew's <laughs> your agent. Too late. Oh yeah, I have one. Too late. Got to keep it in the family. What's the name <laughs> of the alien? Can we do tick? Can we do twit talks? Twit talks. Uh, uh, talks. Uh, for for the sake of the show, it's a new revenue stream, Lisa. <laughs> I'll, I'll do them if it goes to the show. Right? I think I just heard her run into the studio. Hey, community huh? manager. <laughs> <laughs> so I searched. What's the name of that A and P book? Because I searched for A and P. On um, on Audible, and I got the Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. I don't think no, no, no. that's it's the same. The, uh, look, uh, the Great A and P and the Struggle for Small Business in America by Mark Levinson. It is on. It is on audio. The audio. Great. A uh, yes, that that business Cthulhu crossover. Yeah, yeah, book yeah. So <laughs> it was the the Lovecraftian horror that came yeah. from the yeah. FTC. There it is. There it is. I got it. Okay, I just wanted to. Uh, why do I know that name, Mark Levinson? 
Uh, he also did the book about um, uh, uh, shipping containers, the box. Oh. Which I wish were an audible. It's not. It's killing me. It's, it's just exactly, that's exactly the kind of book I don't need to mark it is. up. Read the words. It is just an audible. Interest. It is an audible. The box is? Yeah. How the shipping container made the world smaller and the world economy bigger. Oh, heck, I'm boarding it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everybody. You were here the day Leo convinced <laughs> Jeff Jarvis to buy of a book about a shipping of container. Something. <laughs> oh, y'all, y'all. Should I, should I should I start talking about the? I'm very proud that I got a whole font of of letters. I can start talking about Gutenberg stuff if you want. Oh my! Oh, Where I did you order time. that? Is that lead type? No, I went for to the Museum of, of Printing. Oh. I went to the Museum of Printing, and this is they hand them out uh, at the door. A font that was made. No, 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 no. I bought them. They were not cheap. Oh, okay. This is this is a <laughs> ten point type. Now imagine if That's somebody tiny. Poses, you got a set type. That's tiny. Word after word after word after word with these little yeah. tiny things. Yeah. Is that letter one after letter? letter? What is? What yeah, are we it's looking? One letter. At? Yeah. It was one letter in a. In a in Would a, they ever have like, uh, like the, like ready made? So you just pop it in. Uh, that there was there was an effort to do that to have all kinds of of of, of, of it's funny. You should ask me, Leo. Since you asked, I'll tell you. I think we have a new TikTok <laughs> channel. The Jeff inventor of, of, the, of the stereotype also, and and the and the iron press also worked <laughs> on this, and uh, the problem was the typesetter said that the, the type case was just too huge. I know where to find the T and the H and the E, but the time I got to remember where the the is, oh, I reached yeah. for it. Good point. But you might also be interested. Yes, there was <laughs> late in the 1800s. See, it's got me going. Late in the 1800s, there was a competitive. I swear this is true. A competitive sport of typesetting. Oh yeah, the Swifts <laughs> would do this. And they would they would do it in in in, in dime museums, and, and there would be cheering crowds of people watching them set type for big prizes, until the International Typographical Union ordered them to stop because they knew that they would lose against the line of type. A charming wow. story of technology. It's amazing. Not our times. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I know. You're gonna you're gonna edit that out. I know. I know. Go ahead. Cryptocurrency Sorry. platform oh, I Poly think. Network. I didn't actually tell this story. Last week, I should have because it has a happy ending. Hit with a major mm -hmm. attack, hackers made off with more than six hundred million dollars worth of cryptocurrency. Then, in a bizarre twist, the hacker returned four hundred million, is withholding two hundred million until quote everyone is ready. And <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And then. Poly Network promised him a half million dollar bounty for restoration of user funds and invited him to become its chief security officer. <laughs> After he finishes his jail term? Uh, Mr. White Hat is his name. That's how you apply for a job, right? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> they offered him a half million dollar bug bounty. He turned down the bounty offer, however... Uh, in a message embedded in a digital currency transaction on Monday, which is, of course, the best way to put out a press release, the hacker said, I'm considering taking the bounty as a bonus for public hackers if they can hack the poly network. Oops. There, there goes your job offer, buddy. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, Chief Security Advisor, to extend our thanks and encourage Mr. White Hat to continue contributing to security advancement in the blockchain world together with Poly Network, we cordially invite Mr. White Hat to be the Chief Security Advisor of Poly Network. If he would uh, just surrender, I mean, uh, come on down <laughs> to the office, we'll be glad to provide him with some golden handcuffs. <laughs> And not diamond hands? No, diamond hands. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Should we do a, uh, I don't know, we should do some Google stories. Uh, no, we did. These, we these did are all believe. boring. Good, uh, we just, talked about Pixel 5a. How about the uh, delightful Google ad imagining the Perseverance rover using Google Photos? I don't know why this is delightful. I guess it so. has a robot that's on Mars. Everyone loves perseverance. There's a world outside of Yonkers. Oh, it's a musical. It's from it's from Wally. -E. That's the beginning song in Wally. -E. Just for you, Aunt. It's Mars Perseverance Rover the musical. What's this doesn't sound like this is from Wally. -E. 
No, it's the it's it's they used it in Wally. It's a song from like a 1930s movie. Yeah, it's like it is Hello Dolly, I think. But they played it in Wally. It was his it was his favorite. He plays it over and over. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Sorry. I know it's not from Wally, but that's where I was like. Hello (gasps) Wally. Thank God it's over. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) You would love Hello Dolly. It's the it's the charming story. Of a matchmaker from Yonkers. <laughs> Poor aunt. Poor aunt. Don't, don't be My, my aunt. hope is there's going to be a whole subsection of the society on the Twit Club of musical fans. Just <laughs> crazy. Oh, I'm starting. I'm starting a new chat room right now. <laughs> Lovers of the musical. L O T M. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Musical memes for Ant. Yeah. Note to yeah. self: mute that channel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the boss now. Uh, I guess we should mention this. I I'm not that bullish about the prospects. Remember. Twitter had this notion of creating a kind of an open federated Twitter called Project Blue Sky. They have hired what many people consider to be a very good choice crypto developer, Jay Graber, to helm the initiative, particularly Mike Maslin, who did was part of the interview process for this job. Um, he said Jay is an excellent choice. He's He was one of my first choices. Very she happy. Was yeah. She. Pardon me? She, Jay is she. Oh, you're right. She, absolutely. Yes, not he. <sighs> um, I, I see. I think that Blue Sky. We've talked about it before, but I think theoretically it could be really quite amazing and quite oh, wonderful. And give I us would love it. So yes, let's hope that it's, let's hope uh, yeah. this is a good sign. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, why are you so against Blue Sky? I'm not like, against really it. I'm pro it. Because he's growly. I just he's don't just think that Twitter is going to do it. I think this is lip service, right? But maybe, maybe if they could find a way. To monetize it, but then that kind it's of about, is against- it's about an, a value added layer on top of the commodity. The the speaking becomes a commodity. The finding, the recommending becomes the value. That's my that's my view of what this means. But that's like Jack can look Graber at me, uh, told TechCrunch in January she saw a major opportunity in Twitter entering the decentralized social space. Uh, due to the hefty user base on the Twitter platform, which will eventually itself migrate to the protocol. The company has said, "Well, I mean, if they do it, that just seems kind of utopian. I, if they do it, I'd be very happy. Are you kidding? Yeah. So try to be happy. Try to be. I'm excited. Well, good Imagine choice, Jay Graber. World. Good choice. Good choice. That's better. Um, this didn't poop sound poop. so convincing. Good choice. <laughs> Twitter." I didn't realize this, but uh, back in April, according to the information, the Chinese government took a seat and a stake in ByteDance, the TikTok company. A subsidiary thereof. Subsidiary thereof. TikTok is a subsidiary of (laughs) ByteDance. Were you just mocking Jeff? <laughs> Excuse yes. me, but that's a subsidiary. Like, what is happening here? <laughs> I mean, if you really pay attention, just to, tried to make to the articles of incorporation, you would know that ByteDance <laughs> in TikTok is a subsidiary thereof. First I appreciate your dedication to accuracy. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mr. I don't need any evidence. I don't need any. Data. I don't need no I don't need stinking evidence. I got this. <laughs> I believe my lion eyes. Uh, Chinese government apparently it also acquired a stake and a board seat in Weibo, the big uh, social network in China. So and that's so an, that's interesting. I think it's is it is it Ted Cruz? Who is it who's trying to say that that Biden should now turn off TikTok because of this? Oh really? Oh yes. Mm. Well, one of them. Well, well. Hey, BlackBerry. (laughs) Uh, I don't know about this. BlackBerry, apparently, talk about reporting and obligation to report, uh, knew about a flaw in its QNX operating system that had been around for some time. And, though, the reason they have been marketing QNX to people as the, the most secure 
the for IoT, they put it in cars, they put it in medical devices. And the idea was that BlackBerry was securing the heck out of it. And then to find out that they couldn't even do the bare minimum, which is when someone reports a vulnerability, instead of saying, oh, thank you, we should fix that. They said, shh, don't tell anybody, and then refused to fix it. Microsoft Security Research has announced in April they discovered the bad ALEC vulnerability, which affected a lot of different uh, software, found it in a number of companies' operating systems and software. In May, those companies, many of them, worked with the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, and Infrastructure Security Agency <clears throat> to publicly reveal the flaws and urge users to patch their devices. BlackBerry was not among them. BlackBerry thought, oh, bad... Alec doesn't impact us, even though uh, CISA had concluded that it did. More than 200 million cars, which are among the many things that use QNX, a real-time operating system, along with critical hospital and factory equipment, was therefore vulnerable to hackers. The company opted to keep it secret for months. Oops. Not good. Not good. Not good. <laughs> A uh, lot of cars have QNX. My old uh, my old Audi had QNX, I think, as it's on. Yeah, it was, I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. Hey, Didn't some of the luxury know cars that, have it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tons of cars do. It was it was like it was kind of like free yard toss for people who. Right. One hundred and ninety five <laughs> million vehicles. BlackBerry called it in June, the key to the future of the automotive industry because it provided a safe, reliable, and secure foundation for autonomous vehicles. <laughs> secure, did you say? Yeah, secure? whoops. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. They said that tongue in cheek. Shame. 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 We should make Blackberry walk naked down the streets of Ottawa. Um, I think it's interesting to talk about, if you don't mind. Yeah. The Facebook widely viewed content report. Okay. Here it is. This is from transparency.fb.com. It's their widely viewed content report. What people see. So this is a, this is out of some controversy here because Facebook had a, um, a tool called, has a tool called CrowdTangle. And Kevin Roos of the New York Times used it to say, well, here's the top things that CrowdTangle, Facebook's own tool that they bought, right. says are the most um, um, popular, most seen things on Facebook. And there were others, I think Maznick might be one of them, uh, who, who uh, maybe it wasn't Maznick, uh, some other smart people said, well, we really don't know how big is big. And this doesn't make a lot of sense. And CrowdTechnical kept going and it was useful for journalists. And they kind of made Kevin Roos in this. And then there was an internal debate in Facebook about this, that this is not making us look good and we shouldn't be doing this. And they pulled apart the team and then Facebook now came out with another report, which as usual gives you part of the story, not the whole story, which is the issue here. But it says the thing that I've I've said all along is because at no two people see the same Facebook, how if you say something is number one in Facebook, how big is that? It's not no very idea. big. It's 0.1% it's of all content views. Yeah, uh, they say that's because given the customized nature of newsfeed, most of what people see on Facebook is personalized for them specifically. So, so this does go back to the earlier discussion, too, about, well, this turned out on Facebook and it influenced the whole world. Well, part of the data I want, pardon me for wanting it, is to say, well, how many people actually saw it? It right. could have been number one, but it could have been number one among 25 million things. And it's the long tail of long tails of long tails. Right. And so it's, it's, it's important to have data like this, though I'd rather have it done independently. So that we can say, how big is big? How influential is influential? This is important. The vast majority, this is from Facebook's Transparency Report, the vast majority of content viewed in newsfeed during the second quarter of this year, 87.1%, did not include a link to a source outside of Facebook. <laughs> Most of these links are in posts shared by pages that people follow. This means the majority of newsfeed content views in the U.S. were on posts without links and were from content viewers, friends, or from groups they were connected to. Content that did not come from friends, pages, people followed, or groups that they were a part of also referred to as unconnected posts made up a relatively minor percentage of content views. I don't know if that's meaningful, though, because there's a lot of people who follow 
you know, anti vax oh, crappy, groups. crappy pages. Crappy, yeah, crappy exactly. Pages. That's, that's mm-hmm. an issue, too. That's why we need more data. But yes, but it's still interesting. How big is big on Facebook? Oh, this is trending on Facebook. It may be trending among very few right. people. It's very dilute. Yeah. Well, wait, 1% of like 3.5 billion people point is one. still like. Point one. Point one. Oh, point one. Point I was one. like, that's still a lot. I mean, that's 10, yeah, yeah. 30 million people. It's still large. People. It's still large. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the stuff that is that is among that list at that level, most popular is anodyne, is obvious. Right. Uh, and that's partly Facebook's doing, right? If you, got, I went into Facebook the other day, and I just, if you search for vaccination, last time I did it, it's all news because I think Facebook's trying to do that now. I am just very happy not being on Facebook. That's all I can say. I just don't miss it. I have it. a story. What you're missing. Sure and it has like Google it. in it. Ooh. Good. You want a Google story? Yeah. Y'all matter. Google affiliated smart home protocol interoperability. Woo woo. Um, it's Google, Amazon, Facebook, not Facebook, sorry. Google, Amazon, Apple, Apple and Samsung. Samsung. All got together and were like, hey, let's make your smart home stuff interoperable. They called it Project Chip for a while. Now it became Matter, or it became Matter earlier this year. And it was supposed to be out this fall, but they're going to delay it until the first half of next year. And while oh, I am sad. Sorry, Stacy. I'm sorry. I know. It's what's very so disappointing. Can, can, what's contributing to the delay? A couple things. One, I think they're doing this a little differently. They are releasing a full software development kit. So the full SDK is going to come out and they realize that, oh, they, I think they took a look at their code and they were like, yeah, we should work on this a little bit longer. Um, I think the, co- the COVID coming back, uh, the Delta variant has kind of pushed them tests back a little bit. Some of the uh. testing events. But also, I mean, I'm really sad. They say also that more companies join, but I think that's just a a BS kind of just, Mm. you know, if you can't handle 20 more companies joining your standards organizations at the last minute, that's a problem. So I'm going to hope that's not the real issue. Um, But I think it's actually okay, because I'd rather have a good standard coming out. It's really disappointing for people like me who are waiting to buy new smart home stuff that's matter certified. We should still see people releasing their plans at CES or in that time frame, but um, but it is kind of a letdown. Is it still worth waiting for a matter certified yes. device? You think so? Yes, I, I'm getting a lot of people who are a little unsure about what Matter is going to do. So people are like, "Oh, I need a new doorbell. I, I'm going to wait and buy a Matter one." I was like, "Don't do that," because doorbells aren't part of the certification. If you're waiting to buy new locks, new light bulbs, maybe a new HVAC, those kind of things, then yes, sure, wait. But don't wait. And I would also say, realistically, the soonest you're going to buy a matter certified device is going to be the latter half of next year. Ooh, right? so a year so, from now. What? So, I mean, you can buy things that are likely to be upgraded. Like Philips says, hey, we're going to upgrade everything. So if you want to invest in new Philips light bulbs, great. Um, the nano leaf bulbs things some of these things people already if the people have come out go ahead and buy it but like i would not buy door locks right now because none of the lock makers are like this is what we're doing um actually you say so, in your article that it's going to be first half of next year for the sdk and the start of a certification yes. program which means probably it's going to be the following year later that you'll actually <laughs> be able to get devices uh it'll be towards the holiday season of yeah. next year i think yeah. yes i mean there's some like Google and Amazon, they're going to have their stuff ready. And a lot of the companies who are participating, they're already working with this stuff. Yeah, so yeah. so it will be pretty cool. They're working on the SDK and development. Yeah. So, But if you yeah. if you aren't part of the membership and you, you don't have access to any of this, then yeah, it's going to be a right. little bit longer for you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not home automate until next year. Yes? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I haven't missed it so far. <laughs> I do actually no. I have Hue lights, and I, was I can, like, Leo, I, have lights. I know you have home automation. I have some stuff. home automation. I have doorbells. I have, you know, voice assistants. But I can say, you know, turn off the lights, turn on the lights, and there's lights in the living room and lights in my office. How is it possible that these lights can be upgraded? I would assume there's some hardware limitations. So a lot of the lights that will be upgraded. So Philips has two brands. They have their fancy Hue ones Mm -hmm. and they have their cheaper Wiz ones. The cheaper Wiz ones will not be upgraded. The Hues will be because they're running through a hub. So the hub will get a software update that talks to the lights. That makes sense, yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Some lights that run things 
well, no. Yeah, no. We'll just go with no. Some of the lights, like Nanoleaf put out light bulbs with thread enabled, and they did that to make it eventually compatible with matter. Let's, uh, let's play the drums and do a Google changelog. The Google changelog. Now that it, sounded normal. That's, it's, it's exactly the same as last no. week. No. That sounded normal. <laughs> John, is there, do you have any? <laughs> Last week was weird. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I, we don't know. We can't understand it. It sounds exactly the same to me. But anyway, <laughs> Google Fuchsia, Google Fuchsia. The update is rolling out widely to first generation Nest Hubs. If you have one of these Nest devices, they used to run on kind of Chromecast, Crackcast OS. Now, kind of seamlessly behind the scenes they're gonna all be fuchsia um so there you go so finally a fuchsia has a life fuchsia is alive it's alive google maps uh just added a bunch of new features including just for jeff jarvis a dark mode no! uh, which is worse dark mode or musicals musicals dark mode I love them both. No, which is worse, dark mode or moral panics? Oh, that's <laughs> another matter entirely. So dark that's mode. That's hard, Stacey. That's hard. I didn't know this. Uh -huh. In the past, uh, you could not share your location from Google Maps to iMessage, but now you can. And you can, uh, uh, it's a live sharing, so it'll be automatically updating. I've used that. I guess I must have used it in uh, either on an Android device or on an iPhone, but it's a great feature. Live traffic updates, best restaurants, dark mode, and dark mode. All new features in the new dark mode, Google Maps. Google Calendar will soon let you share where you're working from. This is, this is a sign of the time. Starting in August, yeah. end of August, end of this month, You'll be able to indicate where you're working from directly on your calendar. You can add weekly working location routine and update your location as plans change. I'm at home right now. I'm in my car. I'm at work. Nice. I do love being able to see where the, the kids are on yeah. the maps. Yeah. Uh, that, that's so... Because I, I, I want them to be independent, but at the same time, it, yeah. it's just a little bit of peace of mind. That seems fair. Yeah. Mean. At what age do you turn that off? At what age do I what? Turn it off. Turn it off. When do you stop spying um, on your children? When, you, when you're out of the house. College? In, okay. Yeah, yeah. When they're out of the when house. When you're out of the house. And yeah, you're not responsible for them anymore. Yeah. But, but, but secretly, 46, Stacey. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know where Jake is right now, Jeff? Um, no. No. Uh, I think uh, both my kids have Find My turned on on their phones uh, because they want to, if they lose it, they want to be able to find it. And they're, we're all in the family, so I think I could see their location. You know who turned really? off her uh, location is Lisa. She doesn't want me to know where she is. I, I don't have my, my location. On. Yeah. Yeah. Should I be suspicious? I don't have mine on. Yeah, I just saw, I just saw a, a <laughs> haze come over your psyche. Should here. I be worried? <laughs> oh. No, I know where she is at all times. She's right there down the hall. Right. Uh, YouTube on iOS and Android tests instant comment translations for premium subscribers. Good news. We won't be testing instant comments anytime uh, soon. Considering nobody turns on comments uh, these days. <laughs> uh, that's what we have the forums and Discord for. We can at least moderate those. I, an ant. I, an ant. <laughs> Android's newest accessibility feature lets you control your phone with facial expressions. No. Wow. <laughs> That's an effort. Uh, this is part of the switch access, which is in accessibility. So it's really for people who have uh, mobility issues and so forth. You can... Um, Open mouth, then back to resting face is one of the gestures. Smile, then back to resting face is another gesture. That's kind of neat. And then you can... That is pretty neat. Uh, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, there, raising your there, eyebrows. I hate dark mode, and then back to resting face. Yep. Ugh. Looking left, <laughs> looking right, looking up. The feature will by default ask for the user to set expressions for next, 
select and pause, which stops the phone from recognizing other gestures temporarily. So you could have look left, go to the next page. That's great. I think it's mostly for people with mobility issues, uh, but yeah. still, you can That's use it. Kind of tr I'm trying to think if that would be good on the Kindle. I know it doesn't have a camera. Oh, I'm so like, as so you're reading. Like when you're yeah. You're, I can see Anderson. Yeah. Do you have a tick? <laughs> <laughs> something going on over there? <laughs> you want to tell me about? And remember, we talked about Google being sued for $5 billion because the incognito tab doesn't hide what you're doing oh, yeah. from Google? Well, that's being redesigned, maybe in response. If you have the uh, Canary version, the early developer version of Chrome, on Android, you'll be able to see it. Uh, let's see. Here's, here's the on the left, the old version. On the right, the new version. Maybe too much text on the left, right? What, and now it's just what Incognito does. After closing all Incognito tabs, Chrome clears your browsing activity from this device, your search history from this device, information entered in forms. What Incognito doesn't do, Incognito does not make you invisible online. Sites know when you visit them. Employers or schools can track browsing activity. Internet service providers may monitor web traffic. That's a lot clearer. That's much better. Yeah. So and stands a chance for people to read it, considering it's not terrible. It's a lot long. shorter. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's roughly yeah. the same information, but I think it's just in a clearer, a clearer format. And I believe that's the Google change law. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that is all Have she Have you done it? Have you done wrote. it again, Leo? Have you found everything possibly interesting we could talk about? Well, I don't know. Amazing. If you see it's something skill, you want me talent. to... It's a wonder. If you see something... If you see something, say, say something. something. Say something. <laughs> you know me, I will. The state of Hamburg... It's, it's August, you guys. There's not a lot well, this we've Well, been, we've been gassing for an hour and 54 minutes. That's plenty. You don't want to I'm overdo you. your... Overstay our welcome. I have a quick question. Yes. Did you like or hate Chirp? Chirp? He's not on Twitter. He has no idea. Oh, that's oh, right. He has no idea what we're talking about, does he? What you talk that's about, Willis? That's the new Willis? Twitter font. That's the new Twitter font. Oh. I thought it, that was a no Twitter If app. I go there now, will I have it? Ooh, I don't like yes. it. Yes. I hate it. <laughs> yes. Ooh, change. Ah! Ow. No, it's an ugly-ass font. Called Chirp. Well, okay. Well, it's well I'm not alone, because aren't they... Uh, um, doesn't everybody hate it? Not oh, it's, 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 it's change in Twitter. Of course, some people were screaming murder. It's just an ugly font. I don't like the kerning. Yeah, yeah. It's ugly. What was it before? Just not much better. Older. Just do Helvetica. This oh, is uh, God, this is not Helvetica a Helvetica people. This is not a good font. Uh, it's weird. It's just new. Give it a give it like exactly. Oh, people say that who don't really appreciate fonts. But there is oh a, my, there is, oh the font oh says God, something. Did I just get font shamed? <laughs> yes. I think I just yes, got font did. shamed. Yes, you did. <laughs> Anybody who says, oh, it's just a little bigger or a little bolder, or a little less bold, that's not it at all. There's all sorts let, of things. Let me tell the you shape of the fonts. letters. Oh, God, no. The I, I agree with <laughs> I you. I took an entire class on fonts. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> It's uh, expert right. says it's not accessible. I don't. I don't think it's inaccessible, but it's hurting my eyes. I'll tell you that. Well, that's because it's dark mode. No. <laughs> you know, on my website, I have a button that you can make it dark mode, or you can make it light mode. You can make and it which, dark mode. Which website is that? Or you can make that's one of my many websites. <laughs> Leo.fm. It's a button. I put that there for. I call it the Jeff button. <laughs> well, Jeff, Jeff's never hitting it. What do you think? Of, sure. What do you think of this font? You're, it's it's so you can push Jeff's buttons, basically. I think that's exactly. a nice font. Ooh. No, it's ugly. Oh, <laughs> oh. okay, okay. Oh. <laughs> oy, oy, oy. <laughs> There's something basically, about take this. Take your font shaming as an honor. This is something about this font bothers me. I don't. I can't tell you what it is, but it's hurting my eyes. The chirp font. So just ser seriously, go, go to light mode just to see if you think it's any different. I'm just curious. How I do you do that, you. Jeff? I don't know. Huh? I have no idea because I never do it, Leo. Yeah, display, accessibility, display, font you know, size, You know, Chirp actually looks default. a lot like the Discord font, doesn't it? 
Let me see. Oh, yeah, I like it better here. in uh, light mode. You're right. Um, it's still a little, the G's a little weird that there's something a little, um, uh, kind of playful a little bit with this font, like the R. I think that's their, their goal, probably. The G yeah. is funky in Chirp. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I, don't I like noticed it. that because I'm a Giga Stacy. Yeah, oh, it's right. kind of a, mm -hmm. Changes it's color. kind of jaunt, they're trying to be jaunty. It's mm -hmm. a jaunty font and I don't like it. Light. It's called Light. Chirp. What do yeah, you Yeah, I guess Chirp sounds jaunty, doesn't it? <laughs> It it's a kind bit of jaunty. It looks kind of jaunty. <laughs> it's a jaunty font. Jaunty fonty. Um, yeah. Ooh. Oh, y'all. What? what? They killed the fast pass at Disney World in Disneyland and introduced a new Why? fee for... It's the Genie Plus. It's a skip the oh, line benefits no. for a daily fee. That's greedy. That's Disney, otherwise known as Disney. No, wow. but th didn't you have to pay for the fast pass before? They always um, do that. No, they you had just the, had to go they, sign. The e you tickets? could sign up for the fast pass oh. and pay. Did you pay extra? Or did you just show up at the no, like you, you allocated time for it? You pay for. Fast I think you got to choose like three times. Oh yeah, there were certain. Yes, you're right. You got three rides or something that you could yes. do that yeah. too. That's right for free. But uh, but obviously, that's just a come on for the. You know, the super duper thing. fast pass. Yeah. I think we could very reasonably at this point in the show do our uh, our back of the book, our picks of the week. Would you would you all be interested in that? It just means we're, to. we're one step closer sure. to waffles. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, waffles. Waffles. Or pie. I need pie. I'm out of <gasps> pie. Pie. Y'all. Western, no, Eastern Washington, just driving through. No one told me this existed, but you can just drive through all these small towns and they all have a shop that'll sell you pie made with like <gasps> fruit oh. from next door. Oh. And oh. the Weed. pie. Well, okay, cake or pie, Stacy? They serve very different needs. No, you gotta cake answer. Is a dessert. No. Pie is a you breakfast answer. food. You pie answer. is a breakfast food. I'm liking, liking your thinking here. You wouldn't eat I mean, dessert for breakfast, but you might eat a pie for breakfast. You're right. I think I might be more pie just because it's yeah, it's go. more useful. You know, like you could have pie in more circumstances than you can really legitimately have cake. Fair, fair. There Plus you go. fruit and, and dough. I mean, and is your vote the one what I think it's going to be? Pie is pie. always better than cake. Uh, of course. Oh, pie. And Jeff, no, you agree, no I doubt. think. Anybody who eats cacio e pepe. Pie. Um, <laughs> cacio e pie. Cacio e pie. Yes, here is a entire article about pie shops in Washington State. <gasps> oh. Of course, Same it's from part. a site called Washington the State. The state. <laughs> and Mary, Mary and Barry's got to be on that list. Oh, love Mary and oh, Barry. Mary and Barry's mm -hmm. Darren. Yeah. Okay. You got to go to Skagit Valley and in Ferndale in and buy yes. a slice from Barb's Pies and Pastries in the Carnation Building there. Should we, should we take a look at Barb's Pies and Pastries? You had me at Barb's. Barb's. <laughs> Anybody named Barb's Barb. got to make good pies. Look at that. We brought it to ad block detected. Oh. <laughs> There's a paywall. Hey. There's a paywall no blocking pie us for you. from Barb's Pies. No pie Support for you. that creator. What the hell? <laughs> He's the pie Nazi. <laughs> I've never heard of a pie shop blocking good you for her. What What's kind of ads what could be she advertised? In? Yeah. Yeah, what does she advertise? How about, let's go to the Farm's Reach Cafe. Let's see if they have an ad block. Oh, Barb, on, you lost It's Leo. on Facebook. You definitely, oh, definitely lost me. Yep. Right. Farm's Reach. Oh, yeah, Reach. all these places. No, you just, you basically just drive around and like, yeah, you don't need to stop it. Use small. the web. Yeah. Oh, Barb's Pies does not work. Barb's Pies is not it's, uh, it's no oh, longer Barb's. No longer. I think the COVID. The oh, COVID that's why probably. the ad blocker. Oh. Yeah. The co oh, look. I'm being delivered via extensible. I love that. Oh, it's waffle time. <laughs> <laughs> waffle time. Oh, this is mm. oh, well done. Where did you get yeah, this that's waffle? Yeah, kind of a toasty waffle. Oh, listen. You got this crunch. waffle from me? Oh, is there, a, is there something on here? Oh, it's an Eggo thick and fluffy cinnamon brown sugar waffle. Ooh. Oh, those are delicious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stacy rates waffles. Here we go. 
<laughs> oh, those are delicious. Well, I love the that. gusto that you said that with. <laughs> what, is your, what is your pick of the week, Stacey? <laughs> All right. My pick of the week, I, I wanted to do this last week, and I keep screwing up the name, so I'm going to do it. I'm looking at it right, looking at it right now. Okay. This is how they tell me the world ends, the cyber weapons arms race by Nicole Perloff. And I, I'm a little late to this because I didn't want to read it because I was like, dude, I know all about our crappy cybersecurity practices, right? Just stop what you're doing. Go get it because you do not know. And this is a wonderful book for two reasons. One, it lays out a lot of risk factors in common people's language, but is respectful of the tech side. Two, the, sorry, two, as a journalist, it was awesome because she, Nicole talks a lot about her reporting on this issue. So as, as a journalist, it was really interesting to read how she was like trying to find, like this is a hard community to crack and write about. And so that was kind of cool. And at the end, she offers some really good takeaways and advice and also includes kind of some bits of hope that I wished I, I would love to see her write more about. Um, she talks about like Japan and Norway having kind of solved a lot of the cybersecurity problems um, because they, they've they've implemented practices, but I don't know what they were. So, but that would be another whole book. Anyway, the point is that book is great. And even if great. you think you know yeah. that we're screwed, you should really read she's it. She's good. I think she's she mm -hmm. writes for the she's the New York Times cybersecurity reporter. She's very good. This is how they tell me the world ends. Nicole Pearl yes. Pearl Roth. I oh, another. and she talks about Russian interference in the election, and it almost made me cry. <sighs> <laughs> how dare she make you cry? How dare she? I'm going to add this uh, to my uh, audible. Thank you. I've got that in the A and P. So I'm. I'm there you go. This is and the box. Did you add the box book? Plus, he has a new book out after the box. What's the box? I'm, What's That's after the box? The box? You just you just showed the me container the, book, ships. Uh, the book I could buy. The container yeah. ships. Oh, the container ships. Mark Levinson. <laughs> yes. Oh man. Just what happens after the crowed. box? Uh, well, that's about how globalization is not what you think. I, I just saw it in the listing there, thanks to Leo. And outside, how the, the box, shipping container made the world smaller and the world economy bigger. And then outside the box, another Mark Levinson. He apparently only writes books with "box" in the title. How global <laughs> global global globalization? How globalization changed from moving was that, was stuff that a to have another whiskey? Box? <laughs> yeah, I was like, "What's in that waffle, man?" Stop eating all. I got some bourbon syrup here. <laughs> think of bad data. Give off waffles. How global? <laughs> yeah, that book. Okay, thank you, Stacy. That's a good recommendation. I like that. Um, Mr. A and P. <laughs> Not Mr. A N T. A N T. Mr. A -N -T. No, Mr. Mr. A N P. Mr. A N P. Mr. So somewhat related. I'm, I'm. I don't know why I'm fascinated by these things, but I'm fascinated by ghost kitchens. <gasps> Me too. During yeah. Me too. Um, COVID, and I've never knowingly ordered anything from a ghost kitchen, but the business just fascinated. We can hear you chewing, Leo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it's thick. I at and, least mute when I eat my it's waffles. It's thick and fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. Yep. We so don't Wendy's, hear fluffy. <laughs> Wendy's is to open 700 ghost kitchens with reef technology. What? <laughs> I'm making Leo hungry talking about Wendy's. He's going to go get a double. Uh, so what fascinates me about this is that the um, the fast food business, like the department store business, Used to be in great measure a real estate business, right? McDonald's was was became right. they own the, the land, they, real estate, right? You franchised the restaurant, but they kept the land, and and they and they knew the science of where to yep. put it, yep. and so on and so on and so on. So it just strikes me that the, the ghost kitchen thing, which uh, what do they think that they're going to make between five hundred thousand and one million per unit of what? sales? That is, it's just a it's just mm. a little truck. So what well, is reef, or what or is the a, reef? It's a warehouse. Oh, it's a warehouse. You know, it can be anywhere. It could because yeah, there's it no need to be public. You just need people to be yeah. able to drive the food somewhere. The Uber, right? the Uber guy comes and gets it. Yeah. Um, and and so the value of real estate in this business just kind of went nowhere. It's it's like the opposite of WeWork or something like that. I I just find it interesting. That's all. Um, I wanted to spend enough time here so Leo could get his whole waffle down. 
Well, so that's interesting. It's so they can expand in areas where they don't have stores, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. also to deliver, like if people, they're making a bet that people have changed the way they're going to get and eat food. Oh, good point. Yeah. Right. They, yeah. they want it delivered. But I, I like This is exactly yeah, what I was I like talking about earlier. They, I, I just find it fascinating how the pandemic has changed culture in a kind of somewhat permanent way. I'm sorry, Stacey, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, no. I was just going to jump on the fact that Jeff's comment about real estate is really, that's very smart. Oh, yes. And I yes. wonder, like... Like if you think about McDonald's being Don't optimized be so for highways, how would you optimize delivery for mm. like delivery drivers? Right. Because you right. see some neighborhoods are actually fighting back against like localized, highly localized Amazon warehouses because they don't want the traffic running through their streets. So, huh. If you haven't seen The Founder yet, which is a biopic about Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, in that movie, he has the insight, oh, I'm not selling hamburgers. Yeah. It's a real estate business. Yeah. And they, they dramatize it very effectively. They show. And Did you know that Ray Kroc movie. also sent me a hate letter? No. Oh, he wow. called me a nickel millionaire. <laughs> wow. What, what was Frank the, Sinatra what, called him a bum, bum and the founder of McDonald's <laughs> called him a nickel millionaire. What does that mean you have a million nickels? What well, that means it means you're kind of with heirs. So there was a, a new McDonald's on Van Ness in San Francisco, a very fancy one in the day. I remember and that I one. I reviewed it for my column. Yeah. And I was disappointed. There was a picture of me in the, in the paper looking very sad Aww. over a quarter pounder and um, uh, in a coat and tie trying to look like I was respectable doing this. And mm. he was enraged. And he sent a letter to the paper, enraged, that I dared do this. And I called him. That's hysterical. On the phone. And I said, Mr. Kroc, you don't understand. I I sometimes eat at McDonald's five times a week, which was sad and true. And I said, I love McDonald's. I believe in quality control, sir. And this store was not up to your standards in quality control. We hit it off brilliantly then, and everything was wonderful. That Van Ness McDonald's has been closed. No. Oh, yeah, long, no. ago, long ago. Yeah. Across from, the, oh. uh, across from the opera house, right? Yeah, which is where you want to go after the opera is to go to McDonald's. They shut it in nineteen in uh, twenty fifteen. They shut it down six years ago. I remember oh, them. That's so sad. Because I used to go there before the opera. Because yeah. <laughs> I am a nickel millionaire also. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> wow, Mister Ant Pruitt, your pick of the week. Uh, I want to shout out a show on Netflix. This is Pop. Uh, I've only watched two episodes, but these two have been so well done. The first one uh, spoke about the R&B group Boys to Men and how they pretty much changed the uh, R&B and pop industry back in the days in the early 90s and how everybody right after them decided to emulate them. And it pretty much put them out of music because you get the likes of NSYNC and Backstreet Boys and so on and so forth. And then T-Pain in episode two. Where they oh, talk the King of Auto Tune. Tune. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a, that one was really, really good because T-Pain is, is ridiculously talented with, uh, with music composition. It, it's, I didn't care for the Auto Tune sound, but his arrangements, so I've always thought his arrangements were, were oh, quite it took nice. over the world. I see that but, the uh, Stockholm group is the third episode. Oh, I am going to definitely watch this. This is it is, great. it is really, really well done. Netflix has just been crushing it with their own content here recently. And then uh, my second pick is I may I've been putting more uh, art up there, and I figured our Twit folks might like this one yes. just for my little play on words. It's called Error Fire Not found i loved your cat one <laughs> somebody bought it right out from under me though i gotta say <laughs> but this one i called it error fire not found because oh it's a 404 it <laughs> but there's an actual story behind it um i snapped that uh at about mm, no three or four in the morning while i was out traveling one night for work and a fire alarm went off in the hotel and there was no fire, and while I was outside, while I got up, I decided to take my camera with me just because I'm weird enough like that. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, huh, 404 on the back of this truck, and there's no fire here. This would be a cool image. It really literally was not found. And I like your price, <laughs> which is 1404 Ethereum. Oh, you noticed that too, huh? Yes. <laughs> I like it. You didn't want to make it 404 
point four oh four Ethereum. No, That'd be too expensive. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, one no. in front of it. That's great. One more thing to plug because it's coming up soon, and I want everybody to register for Ant's yep. photo workshop in New Orleans. That's right, the Wanderers Photo Excursion in New Orleans with myself, Mr. Steve Brazo, Mr. Uh, Freddie Clark, and Mr. Andrew Scravini. Uh, going to talk about food photography. Going to talk about uh, beverage photography. Going to talk about street photography. New Orleans is such a great place concerts. to take pictures. Oh. And so far, it is still on. Um, there have been some events canceling in New Orleans um, at the same time that we're there, but not everything is canceled. So, so far, everything is still on for us. So go ahead and register and we'll see you there. I love it. There's Ant's shining picture. <laughs> Ant Pruitt. My resting face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did is you, your resting face. Did yeah. you use the chirp font on this? This looks like the chirp font. <laughs> um, maybe they did. That's that's Mr. Freddy's site. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like the church chirp font. Um, You're going to see it everywhere now, Leo. Oh, I much prefer Babus. I think we've talked about that before. Babus? Mm -hmm. I don't know that one. B-E-B-A-S-N-E-A-U-E. -E -E. Babus. New. I I, I guess I am I I have to apologize because uh, I am amongst font connoisseurs. I had no and idea. Lato. <laughs> I no, did not. no, you're you're only amongst a few. I just want to I be like, clear that waffles better than fonts. Waffles better than fonts. I will not argue that. <laughs> yep. I have some amazing stories about about how the font Jansen, which was the first Roman font, drove later designers insane. But I'll spare you and do that another time. Uh, my pick of the week from Netflix, <laughs> it's a little something called Waffles and Mochi, two of my, <laughs> two of my favorites uh, all together in one exciting little cartoon. We can't show this because I'll be taken wow. down by Netflix. Um, Is that Michelle Obama's thing? No, it's a card to someone. I just searched for waffles on Netflix. I just, I was making a joke. I, I oh, no, I think that's her. Didn't she do the waffle? Isn't she affiliated with that? Oh, well, little did I know. Maybe she is. Yeah, that's Michelle Obama's. Uh, she's the I knew producer. I liked her. Waffles and mochi. <laughs> I knew I liked her. That's awesome. Today. I thought this was a sincere pick. Man, <laughs> I am just... Mm. Mm. Well, here's my pick of the week. Ego thick and fluffy <laughs> waffles. Belgian style. Cinnamon. Mmm, cinnamon. Brown sugar. I like it that John cut up the box so that I could hold this up, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> There's Hashtag only like six in a box, so, you know, you really don't get a lot. John, where do the other five go? Well, there's other on. options. Oh, Was original blueberry, brown sugar, cinnamon, and double chocolatey. Ooh. I find my favorite is the normal because the brown sugar, cinnamon even are a little too sweet. And the chocolatey and blueberry, definitely too sweet. I make my own sourdough waffles. And uh, sometime we'll just invite you over for Waffle Fest. It'll be oh, fun. We make ricotta waffles. Ooh, I've done wow. that. Still, that is really good. That is really good. I need to step my game up. <laughs> there are no ego. And or just visit. <laughs> ricotta waffles, that's for sure. Hey, thank you, everybody, for putting up with us for the last couple of hours. Uh, Amp Pruitt, hands-on photography. Who's on hop this week? Uh, actually, this week is a guestless week. I'm going to talk about some uh, alternatives to the world of Photoshop because, yeah, there are some options beyond Photoshop to do photo manipulation oh, and yes. post processing. We were talking about that. Yes, I'm excited to hear all about that. It's we going are, to be fun. We have our, our different choices. Uh, thank you, Ant. It's always thank a pleasure you. to have you on. Uh, Mr. Jeff Jarvis, now we've got another thing to say. <laughs> yeah, Our very own nickel millionaire, mm -hmm. Jeff Jarvis. He's also the Leonard Tao. I'm sorry, the director of the. Let's give him the full title: the director of the Town Heights Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the Greg Greg Newmark, Newmark Graduate Newmark. School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Thank you, Jeff. Great to have you. Thank BuzzMachine.com for his blog. And, of course, Stacy Higginbotham. Stacy on IOT.com is her website. Subscribe to the newsletter. Check out the events. Woohoo! Listen to the podcast with Kevin Toffel. At Giga Stacy on the Twitter. Thank you all. 
Have a great uh, week. We do Twig every uh, Wednesday. Uh, about uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. You can watch us stream it live at twit.tv slash live. There's audio or video there. People who watch live often like to chat live in our IRC chat room. Open to all at irc.twit.tv. Club Twit members also have their chat room uh, in our Discord server. For more information on that, club twit I'm sorry, twit.com slash club twit on-demand versions of the show available at twit.tv slash twig there's a this week in google amazon channel of course the best thing to do would be subscribe in your amazon Did i say amazon we don't have an amazon channel <laughs> although that's not a bad <laughs> idea uh there is a twit.tv there is a i think i'm in a kind of a waffle coma right about now. <laughs> there's a youtube channel i don't I don't think you're ready for waffles. I know. Then. I maybe not. <laughs> I have to, should I work my way up? With start with silver dollar pancakes, Swedish pancakes, yeah. and <laughs> slowly increment increase the amount of sugar intake. The sugar is getting them. Ah. <laughs> oh yeah. Just next time, uh, you know, half a waffle. <laughs> uh, there is a YouTube channel dedicated this week in Google, and of course, if you have a podcast client, you could search for us. In fact, that's probably the easiest way to get, make sure you get it every week. And uh, if there is a place where you can leave reviews on that podcast client, please give us a five-star review. Tell the world of your love for Waffle Mania. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week on This Week in Google. Bye-bye. You know what's fun? Android. You know what's even more fun, though? All about Android. That's my show, Jason Howell, along with my co-hosts, Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and we welcome guests on each and every week from throughout the Android ecosystem, developers, Googlers, journalists, people who are all geeked out about the Android operating system. We tell you everything you need to know. Twit.tv slash AAA every Tuesday. We'll see you there.